Uh, it is May 16th, 2019, meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the council president to be presiding. These proceedings, as always, are being audio and video recorded. And as always, we start with public comment. Public comment is a chance for the public to speak on any issue. Um, there's only a couple rules. One, please keep your comments to three minutes or less, because everyone you know, is going to get equal time. And the other is kind of a strange one. We don't respond back to you. And the reason for that is we can only discuss stuff that we post on the agenda in advance. So those are two rules. But everyone is welcome. And I have a sign-up sheet. When this is done, I'll ask if anyone else wants to talk. So unlike a nightclub, if you're not on the list, you can still get in. Um, at the top of the list is Tommy Pease from the Veterans Council. The floor is yours. Good evening, counselors. My name is Tom Pease. I live at 130 Spring Street, Florence, Mass. I am the uh, commander at the VFW Post 8006 in Florence, and I'm also the vice president of the Veterans Council of Northampton. This evening, I'm here to plug our Memorial Day Parade, which is taking place on <coughs> May the 27th this year. Last year was the 150th continuously operated parade in Florence on Memorial Day, the longest continuously run parade in the country. They had approximately between four to 5,000 people attended that, that uh, parade and ceremony. This year, obviously, it's 151st parade. Again, the longest continuously run parade in the country. We step off Monday morning at 10 a.m from Trinity Row. We will use the original parade route that has been used in the past. We'll go Main Street, Park, Pine, Maple, back around to Park Street. We will have a ceremony in the cemetery at approximately 11 o'clock. Uh, of course, we're inviting in, any and all people to come and join. This event takes place rain or shine. This year, along with my comrades at the VFW, we applied for and we got approval for an 11 o'clock flyover by two F-16 fighter jets. They'll be coming out of Rhode Island and uh, weather permitting. They have to have a ceiling of approximately 2,400 feet. Last year we did the same thing, but it was a little cloudy that day. So that being said, this year's theme for the parade, I've taken upon myself along with the people from the Elks that we're gonna be really promoting the American flag. Uh, we'll be leading the parade with approximately five or six American flags. They call it uh, Color Guard in Mass. So uh, as a veteran and all my comrades, we're quite proud of our American flag. So we're really pushing that. Um, again, I'm inviting the entire community to come and join us. Whether, per well, rain or shine, please come and, you know, enjoy the longest continuously run parade in the country. Uh, that being said, I'll hand over the Flag Day operation to Don. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donnie Ripito, and I want to thank you, uh, first and foremost, for having me here tonight, and thank you for your service to our community. I greatly appreciate it. I know quite a bit about life of service. I am a 24-year Navy veteran of the submarine service, and I'm also the Elks president, uh, newly elected. In addition, I'm here tonight because I'm also the Field of Honor Committee Chair. Uh, Field of Honor has its heritage in 9-11. Uh, it started as a result of 9-11 as a tribute to those who lost their lives. Uh, the first positive patriotic symbol coming emerging out of 9-11 was the American flag. To that end, uh, that's where it started. We're running the first Northampton Field of Honor event um, at the Elks Lodge at 17 Spring Street and uh, basically to pay tribute to veterans, service members, and first responders and their spouses. We're the first honor field in the country to also recognize spouses. Um, we're trying to commemorate their service and sacrifice. Um, in our minds, one of, one of the themes behind it is service and sacrifice forever remembered. 
and our honor flags help to commemorate the service and sacrifice of so many that have helped us um, to protect our freedoms and to help us through our everyday lives. The event starts on May 18th and runs through July 13th. We intend to have a community cookout at the end of it to invite folks uh, to join us and we'll retire our flags on July 13th and present them back to the sponsors. Um, we feel like our honor field will encompass three main things. One of them will be grieving. It will be uh, an opportunity for folks to grieve. The second will be healing, uh, which is a, a real priority as well. And the third will be celebration. You know, uh, loved ones have a chance to grieve, heal, and celebrate uh, people that they care about the most. Each honor flag is personalized. It allows um, folks that sponsor them to actually put pictures on the flagpole or write about their loved one in a way that they see fit and uh, appropriate. And um, the goal uh, after this year would be to create an annual event where the community can uh, attend, come out, and uh, pay tribute to those that have uh, supported us so, so much in our lifetime. Um, there are a few calendar events uh, worth talking about. There's a ceremony walk planned for May 24th where those that have fallen, veterans that have fallen aligned to Memorial Day will be invited to come out and uh, we'll have a small ceremony there and offer a ribbon and a flower uh, and decorate the field accordingly for those of uh, veterans that have fallen. And then uh, Again, I've already mentioned the barbecue, um, and we also have a June uh, 15th event for Flag Day. That's my time. Do it. Do you want to <laughs> wrap up in a sentence? No, or? that's all right. I, okay. I just wanted to say thank you for having me here today. I mean, you'll see the solemn array of flags. Those who have passed 17 Spring Street know what's going on already. We have a few flags out there to give folks an idea or a feeling for what's happening. And um, again, I thank you for your time. Thank you. I really appreciate your help. Appreciate you coming here sure. as well. Um, Thank you. So, Steve Connor, our veterans agent. Hi, I'm Steve Connor, the director of veterans service for Central Hampshire uh, County, and our department is working along with the Elks, VFW, and everyone else for this field of honor. Um, you're all going to get an invite in your box about the 24th. And it's an opportunity for those people who want to, who have sponsored a flag, to go hang that ribbon. Uh, it's important. I'm going to be there to do that as well for my father and my uncles um, who served our country and my mother who was a first responder. So um, it's a great event. The other thing I would like to just say is, you know, we had a great parade last year, the 150th. It was big, it was long. This one's gonna be shorter, but I'm hoping it's just as great. And so far, the participation's always been wonderful, even when the weather's not perfect. So I'm really grateful to be able to do this in Northampton and in Florence, um, where I grew up. So I also want people to always, always remember that Memorial Day is a solemn day to remember those that have fallen. And with that in mind, I want people to remember that we're always working on the campaign to try to end veteran suicide. Right now, it's gone from 22 to 20 a day, but that's still epidemic numbers, and we need to address it. Here in our community, we're addressing it by having a veteran's lunch right down on Con Street at the World War II Club every Wednesday. And I want to make sure everyone in town knows that it's there for veterans and their caretakers. Please, if you are feeling like you want to get together with your buds, come down there. We have four World War II vets who never miss it, and we have veterans from all the wars who come down and make a connection every single week at noon. Um, we want you to feel you're honored. That's why we do the things that we do, both Memorial Day Oh, and just a, an aside, for those out there that wonder about Veterans Day, the parade is coming back on Veterans Day right through Northampton again with a ceremony happening at Pulaski Park. But we are planning another type of, um, we've had a veterans breakfast every year that we've had 
the weekend before. We're looking to actually have that on the day so that the speaker and those that come to listen to the speaker might be warm at the breakfast rather than out in the park in the freezing cold on November 11th. So that's our hope. Um, <coughs> that's happening. But please um, thank you folks for always helping me do my job better and honoring our veterans in the community. Um, but we've got some really nice events coming up. But again, spread the word about the Veterans Lunch so that people get connected. Thank, thank you, you so Mr. much. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Thank you very much. Um, now we have, um, and you forgive me any mispronunciations I have, but I think I got this right. Is it Tish Sarani? Yes, it is. My name is Tish Sarani. Some of you have known me for years. Some of you I'm just getting to know. Um, I used to be a business owner. I am not affiliated with the city or the schools at all. I'm 64 years old, retired, raising an eight and nine year old. <coughs> I have a baby that's about to be three out in California with my 36 year old daughter. And I'm confused. I just don't get it. I talked to the school committee two months ago. I told them that things aren't going right. We, the citizens, are not happy. Where are my taxes going? My, my eight year old daughter helped me make this. My wife pays the tax bill. She's a physician in town. She wants to know where her money's going. Really, she has to balance the budget. She has a business. Here's my tax bill. I pay my taxes so the mortgage company doesn't come after me. I think we the citizens <coughs> come after the city. You're not paying your taxes. You're not paying your employees. What's going on? I am so confused. Progressive city? Not anymore. I think we're regressive. We have a beautiful park that has been written up all over the country, probably the world. We're written up for all these things in Northampton. We've got this beautiful park we spent millions on. We have all these new playing fields. We have new this. Well, what about the teachers? No. We have new this. Well, what about the teachers? No. I trust the teachers. I have to. I have two kids that spend all day with them, five days a week. I just finished two years of homeschooling. I have to trust them. So when they say you guys aren't being fair, but I can't come to the meetings to know what you're saying and what you're talking about, I'm confused. But you know, I'm often confused. I'm 64, okay? <laughs> I don't get it. People beep at me when I drive now. <laughs> okay, I'm there. <coughs> so I know I'm not allowed to sit down with either one of you at a coffee shop and say, what's going on? I don't get it. It's not fair. That's all I have to say. It's not fair. But if I have to come back here in another month, I might say more. And it might not be so nice. And then that tax bill might be torn up because I don't know what I'm paying for. I don't want to pay for another park, another playing field. I, want to pay, I don't want to pay for a bunch of solar. I know climate chaos. I want to pay my teachers. And I want to pay them a good living wage. And I want them to be able to retire with decent money. So let's figure it out. Let's prioritize. Stop with paying for this and paying for that that's not necessary. Pay our teachers and pay them now. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dinah Mack here. Dinah Mack. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you for being so attentive and respectful when I spoke here last month. It was really noted by me and by many people who spoke how just really how polite, respectful, and attentive everyone was here. Um, so I want to bring two things to people's attention tonight. Uh, first, that the school committee made a decision to not accept an estimated $800,000 from NACE in the sick leave buyback which would just about cover what our teachers asked for in our last counteroffer. Yeah. Uh, when asked why, the response given was that they believed there would be a rise in absenteeism and as if a teacher would somehow cash in all of their sick time just before retirement. This response speaks volumes. Um, it shows that to some, teachers are not considered professionals who take our work very seriously that we don't have high levels of passion, integrity, and dedication to our chosen careers. I will say it again because it is shocking to me. 800000 or more dollars was turned down, which could cover much of what the cost of our wage increase that we've asked for. 
um, $800,000 of our earned time. Okay, this is sick time that we have all earned through our work. As a colleague said to the school committee, we earn our sick time by arriving to school 60 to 90 minutes early to prepare our classrooms for activities. We stay late. We stay past 6 p.m. We write letters of recommendation. We assess quizzes and essays. We plan future lessons. We work on weekends. We email parents and students way into the night. I've written emails at 11 p.m. at night. Um, we, are, we are working for this time. Um, so this $800,000 that we offered to the city was earned on our own backs. The second thing I want to say is that we are choosing to go work to rule because that is our union's only recourse to bring attention to all of the time beyond our contracted hours that we put in. Everything extra that teachers and school employees do on a daily basis for our students and families. We negotiated on good faith with the city and asked for a very fair wage and wage increase and respectful contract language and this was not met. So we are choosing to go work to rule to make a statement. Not so that things that we all enjoy doing with our students do not happen. Okay? Because we love doing these events. We love our students. We love the events we do. We love volunteering our time because we love our work. Okay? So we choose to go work to rule because this is our picket line. Okay? Work to rule is our picket line. Much of this community supported the strikers at Stop and Shop. They bought their groceries elsewhere. They spread the workers' message in conversation. They spread it online. Some even stood on the picket line to help. So to this community of Northampton, I'm asking that you please see that our work to rule is our picket line. You're not going to see us online because we are in the building. You'll see us online in the mornings, and you'll see us online after school. So one more thing I just want to say is I'm asking the community and family members who will feel an urge to step in and replace the work that teachers do. They're going to want to step in and chaperone events and field trips, dances and picnics. They're going to want to step in to make <coughs> sure that all of these things happen. Okay, so I'm just asking you all who step in to volunteer that realize that when you volunteer to do these things in our stead, you are crossing a teacher picket line. So please Thank do not cross the line. And instead, call the mayor and the school committee and ask them to negotiate a fair wage and fair, respectful contract language so that teachers and employees can go back to doing what we do best, putting our passion into educating Northampton's youth. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Is Andrea Agito here? <laughs> Hi. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I'm going to be really short tonight because I don't have a whole lot to say that hasn't already been said, that we all haven't already said and are keep, we are keep saying. The mayor tonight is presenting a budget to you, or at least that's my understanding. I've been very much educating myself in our city civics, and I thank all of you who have been helping me with that. Um, the mayor is going to add additional funds into the budget for what the school committee proposed in their last negotiations. And I'm just here to say that it's not enough. We appreciate it, but it's not enough to create our livable, fair wages for our employees. And so I really just want to be clear that we're not that far off. We probably need, and my disappointment was that at one, um, two sessions ago, we asked for the numbers of what the additional cost would be because the city told us that, or the school committee told us that it was about $290,000 more that this mayor was going to allocate. And he stood there and was a shining pillar and said, I will ask the city council to add that money, and he's going to ask you that tonight. However, when I asked how much more was our proposal, no one would give me those numbers. So I attempted to figure them out myself. And in my, under my calculation, it's a little more than $250,000 additional. That is not even a dent in our fiscal stability fund. So if the mayor is asking for an additional 300,000 for our school committee, he also can ask for additional an additional 550,000 to bring us 
to a place where our teachers and our staff and our cafeteria workers can at least make minimum wage and our teachers can afford to live in this beautiful city that we love. So again, I say it's not enough. And I encourage all of you in any way you can. And I know that there's not a whole lot because in my education, in my civics lesson, I realized in the city of Northampton, we don't really have any checks and balances. The only checks are you can lower what the mayor puts in his budget, but you don't actually have any power to raise it. So maybe you have power to talk some sense into him. I don't know, but I hope you do. And I hope that you will stand with us as you have stand, stood with many other unions in this city many times over again. Because we're not gonna stop and we're not going to stand down and we're not gonna be quiet anymore. Our teachers have done that many, many times and we're not doing it anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Is everyone on the list? So, um, what we're going to do is continue public. I forgot to put Holly Grant on the list. Oh, no, yeah, I'm going to call for people to come up now. Yeah, don't worry. If you, if you didn't sign up, it's okay. I thought I would just kind of reiterate some of the conventions we have in the council because I noticed a lot of people came in. I think you had uh, a demonstration outside of City Hall, so some people came in after I said this. But just so everyone knows, um, the rules are three minutes. For everybody, everyone gets treated fair. Everyone gets equal time. So three rules. That's why the clock's up there. And the other rule is that we don't respond. Some, it's kind of a strange rule. If you think about it, you come to the city council, you expect your elected officials to answer you. But the reason we don't is because we only talk about stuff that we put on the agenda in advance. So just so you know that. Um, and having said that, everyone is welcome to speak. So I don't know, just on this side, we have people over here. I saw a hand go up here. Do you want to be first? So if you come up, and if you would give your name, <coughs> giving your address is totally up to you, but we do ask you give your town or city of residence, please. And the floor is yours. Okay, good evening. My name is Holly Graham. I'm a resident of Northampton. I live at 90 Pomeroy Terrace, Unit 1, and I also teach 7th and 8th grade English at JFK Middle School. I've taught in the district for eight years now. Um, I haven't <coughs> spoken to the school committee or to the city council. I've written very few letters because I thought this has to work out. It just has to. <laughs> Why would Northampton want to go to work to rule? I kept thinking, I can't be a teacher who works to rule. I work all the time. I actually don't know what I'll do at night. So I stayed really quiet, but I feel like I can't be quiet because of something that happened after school today, um, which is going to have to deal with me telling a bit of a story. I teach English, so I'm good at it. Um, so every year I run a, a contest at JFK Middle School called the Boston Globe Scholastic Arts and Writing Award Contest, and we are an institution at this point. We win awards statewide that are so significantly above private schools. We beat out every competitor that we've had. We've broken records. Some years I've had a generous grant from the NEF, but most years I haven't. Most years I've done it for free. This year we had 17 students win, and it was a Saturday morning, it was freezing. I went to Boston, it was so cold, and I went out. I didn't even think about, God, it's Saturday, because I love this contest, I love what I do. So I went out to Boston on a Saturday like I do every single year, and I'm also super competitive, so I get there really early, because <laughs> I have to have the best seat in the house, because I want to be there when every kid that walks across that stage over and over and over again, they say, so-and-so, John F. Kennedy Middle School, Florence, Mass over and over and over again. No one comes close. I'm telling you, Milton Academy, Deerfield Academy, I shouldn't even name drop, but these schools can't keep up with a tiny public middle school in Western Mass. It's awesome. So this year, I got there early like I always do, and I snuck down underneath one of those velvet dividers that says, no teachers and parents beyond this point, and I do that every single year, but I'm well aware that I'm breaking a rule. And this man came up to me and he said, I know you. You're not supposed to be back here. And I was like, oh, really? You know, I lie about it. Oh, I didn't know I didn't see your hand. And he said, no, yes, you did. You do this every year. Every single year, you sneak underneath this line. I know you. You're a teacher that doesn't follow the rules. I said, yeah, that's right. I am. And I actually work with a lot of people who also don't follow the rules. 
Because following the rules means working to a contract. Following the rules means putting in exactly what you do in the day and doing nothing else. So I've been thinking about this following the rules and I still wasn't gonna speak and I got home today from school and I had this certified letter from the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards and here's what the first sentence says. Dear Dr. Graham, congratulations. The Alliance of Young Writers and Artists presents the Scholastic Writing Awards every year, is pleased to present you that one or more of your students have won national writing medals. We hope you will share this remarkable achievement with your school and community. Fast forward, your school now ranks within some of the top 1% of all the submissions. So the reason I'm sad and the reason that I'm here is because I won't do this next year because I'm about to become a teacher that follows the rules. Thank you very much. So, um, keep on this side. Yes, do you wanna come on up? Whoever, you, you can, everyone gets a chance. Welcome. Hi, I'm Sarah Simmons. I live at 78 Lyman Road um, in Northampton where it was an honor and a privilege to grow up. Um, I've worked at Ryan Rhodes, at RK Finn Ryan Road School for the past 10 years, and I'm speaking to you again to implore you to help your school employees. Um, seven years ago, I'm going to tell you a story too, but it's not a very happy one, I'm sorry. Seven years ago, I started a series of operations to save my life. My mother died of cancer, and she asked me on her deathbed to be screened for the cancer gene. So I waited, and I was screened, and the results were positive. I was terrified. My first surgery was a short one, and I could have it over the summer. The second surgery was more extensive, and I needed to take all of my sick leave or, and the summer to fully recover. So I planned my surgery from May of 2013. My principal at the time went over my sick leave with me and made sure that I would be recovered. That same year, in March of 2013, my then 13-year-old son's father suddenly got the flu, went into a coma, and died. That year, I took all of my bereavement time and used up all of my sick time. My son suffered the following year with anxiety and illness, and there were days when he was just unable to go to school, and he needed to stay home, and he needed me to stay home. I needed all of my sick time the following year to help him through the trauma of losing his father and watching his mother for nine days in the ICU after one of my surgeries became more complicated than was originally anticipated. Why do I tell you all of this? Because this is a real-life scenario where a teacher had to use all of their sick time and was not penalized in the following year. Seven years ago, I was so grateful to work for the Northampton Public Schools. I was a proud Northampton Public School educator. I was grateful to have a principal who fully supported my decision to have my surgeries. I was grateful to have accrued sick time that would allow me to have this life-saving series of surgeries. This is just one, there is just one proposal from our school committee that is disrespectful to our employees in terms of buying back our sick time. There are many. I have sat through the mayor's hour and a half long slideshow and listened while he slapped us on the wrist by stating that negotiations should not be held on public media like Facebook and email. And I ask you, where should we let the secret of our salaries be known? In that same slideshow, our mayor told us that he would allocate additional, additional funds for a fair contract. He also stated that the city of Northampton loses over $2 million to charter schools. I asked him then, and I will ask you now, what do you think our best defense against losing that $2 million to charter schools is? I'm pretty sure Dr. Graham just answered that. Our teachers. In the past 10 years, our city has lost 80% of its award-winning, first-year award-winning Green Spoon teachers. 80% in 10 years because they went to higher-paying districts. I asked our mayor that night how he plans on retaining our high quality educators. And I was hopeful that he would be at our negotiations and this nightmare would come to an end. But he was not there and the nightmare continues. I had another paragraph about my co-teacher, Lisa LeBeau and I, and our countless hours that we spend working with our students. We have two students currently that have shown 95% growth in reading on their Ames Web assessments. I have three more students that have gone from reading 60 to 80 words per minute and are now reading over 120 words per minute. And that doesn't sound like much, <coughs> but it's a lot. 
We were there working through lunch. We were there working Thursday nights. Mostly Thursday nights. Other nights as well. And we won't be next year. You can change this. Thank you very much for those comments. <laughs> so, come on up. Thank you very much Thank you. for your listening. <coughs> and I know this has been very hard for all of you all <coughs> because I know your hands are tied, but I think things can change. I will say one thing. One thing we were offered that is not fair to the cafeteria, we asked the cafeteria, the low, lowest wage become minimum wage, which they did. But that means that a cafeteria assistant is going to start at the same rate as a cook. What are they offering? Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, who else would like to provide public comment? Anybody? Yes, sir. Come on up. Hi there. My name is Jacob Kozlikowski, and I live on um, Cordicelli Street in Florence, and I'm a student at Northampton High School. Um, I came really unprepared to this. I didn't think I'd be talking today, but I felt motivated with all my teachers and such about this topic. So. I just wanted to talk about, um, I guess, my view on what the teachers in this city do for us. Um, I personally, this semester specifically, have been, um, I guess, blessed to be able to work with the teachers I have. Um, I know Mrs. Beth Adams over here is my math teacher. She has made my math experience at the school amazing. Um, she's helped me prep for the SAT, which she doesn't even have to do. Um, my English teacher, Miss Michelle Bernhard, helped me prep for my AP Lang exam. Um, my younger sister, Caitlin Kozlikowski, goes to our schools. Um, she has Mrs. Dr. Graham and Miss D Diana Mack, um, who she speaks very highly of. So I guess what I just wanted to say was that I find it very upsetting and kind of appalling how much our teachers make compared to surrounding districts. And I guess I'm really just worried about we're going to lose so many good teachers. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, who else have we inspired to speak who maybe didn't plan on it? Blair? We're on a first name basis because you attend so many council meetings, so I can just call you Blair. I'm Blair, I live in Massachusetts. And um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on um, the amount of money that the teachers are asking for. And since I do attend a lot of the meetings, I there are a lot of really high numbers pass um, like things that cost a lot of money and they always catch my eye. And um, learning the civic details of the city like is challenging and um, you know, I stand corrected and you know, I know the mayor could correct uh, if I'm wrong about this funding. And he gets paid $90,000 a year. And for instance, like a couple meetings ago, there's $950,000 to construct a cold storage facility at the cemetery to store um, vehicles and equipment for Forestry Parks and Cemetery Division. I'm sure that's important, and um, but uh, that is a lot of money that's there that we're spending. We did spend, or we are spending $100,000, um, if I understand correctly, on one window at Forbes Library. Um, and there is a $650,000 garage for six vehicles that the city has that's only half heated. Um, so yeah, I would encourage people to um, go online and like look at past city council agendas and see you know, what money is asked for and, and how we spend it and what the amount is um, that could be important. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Please. Paula Regano Murray, I live in Northampton. I just have one question that I realize you can't answer. Is it true that the city is about to spend $1 million to purchase Pine Grove Golf Course? course? Okay. That will stand as a rhetorical question, as, as you point out, but thank you. Um, yes, come on up. 
I'm Jessica LaValle and um, I live in Hatfield and I am not going to speak as a teacher in this district tonight. I want to speak as a parent. I have two children who are in this district, one who is in seventh grade and three of his teachers are here tonight and hearing them speak um, just made me realize that you need to hear more from parents about why we have our kids here. I school choice my kids here because of exactly what Dr. Graham was explaining to you because of the exceptional quality of education that our teachers provide. They weren't getting that somewhere else. And that's why they're here. Mm -hmm. And they're learning. And next week, when we go work to roll, my son, who is struggling, will no longer be able to stay after school with Dr. Graham and Ms. Steele to get the help that he needs, that they want to give him, yep. and that they enjoy giving him that one-on-one -on -one attention. That's why my kids are here. My daughter, she's in first grade, she's in second grade now. And in first grade, she was picked up for Title I math. Not because she couldn't do the math, but because she lacked the confidence in her math skills. That's not gonna happen elsewhere, but it happens here. We go above and beyond as teachers and we deserve to be treated equally fair. This is just, it's completely unacceptable. It really is. And I wanna keep my kids here because of them. So I really ask you to consider what we're asking. It's really not much. I have friends that make a lot more money and do the same that we do. But we're not average, neither are they, but they're actually getting paid what is average in this state. And I moved here because supposedly this area is progressive and this is absolutely appalling. I know you guys have heard that before, but really it is. Our kids deserve more. I want my daughter to be able to have Beth Adams as her math teacher in high school. I don't want her to leave. She is an exceptional educator. I just ask you to consider a fair wage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, Susan Biggs, uh, 98 Deerfield Drive. I've lived in the city uh, since 1997. My daughter went through Bridge Street, JFK, and the high school. Um, I coach lacrosse for 19 years. I teach chemistry at the high school for the last 19 years. And it's a great place to work. There's no doubt that a lot of us work there and have chosen, and many teachers have come and taken big pay cuts because it is a great place to work. We have great administrators. Um, they let us teach the way we know we should teach, but um, I'm starting to feel average. <coughs> and um, I did every week, it <coughs> says on my board, I, uh, when I'm after school, which is just about every day, except for Mondays. I me have three meetings a month on Mondays. And so there was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week. And uh, in red underneath, I said, come next Monday, there will be no extra help, no after school, no tardy makeups, no test corrections, no requises. My class was dead silent, and my first period honors chemistry is never silent. <laughs> they were stunned, and they asked why, and I said, well, I can't talk about it. There it is. I said, but I am pretty sure that most, all of your teachers will not be after school for extra help. They were not very happy. Chemistry is a very hard subject, and some kids need a second go at it. I'm not sure in our school day without study halls that we are talking about a flex block, um, which also we would have liked to negotiate a little bit more than school committee would negotiate. Uh, I'm not sure when the kids are gonna get their second go round uh, at chemistry. So it's really sad. Uh, I usually go in the building at 6 a.m. I'm not the first, there's usually three ahead of me. Uh, and I go out the building the earliest 3.15 on any day, but usually 4.35, it used to be 3.30 because I had to go on the lacrosse field, but I haven't coached uh, for four years. My daughter's graduating on Sunday from Smith and was educated very well in the Northampton Public Schools. Uh, but, and again, I too know that you can't raise the budget, but uh, I would encourage you to do what you need to do to um, maybe reject the budget in hopes that the uh, school committee and the mayor will go back to uh, the drawing board, board and consider um, a better wage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sue Sullivan. I'm a Hi. parent and a teacher at Northampton High School. And my daughters both went through the public schools here. 
One of them graduated with the mayor's daughter. She got into 10 out of the 12 schools she applied to. She was the first student to get into Georgetown in over 20 years for Northampton High School. So I'm also an ELL teacher. And a lot of my daughter's favorite teachers are here tonight. And my students will not be able to stay after school. They are reading at second and third grade levels and they're in high school. So they come after school to try and just keep their head above the water. I'm not gonna be able to help them next week. It breaks my heart. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Please. My name is Beth Adams, and I've lived in Northampton for 19 years. I have three kids who, my husband and I have three children who have gone through the schools and graduated and um, moved on. Uh, my husband and I both teach here. I've always loved living in Northampton, loved teaching here. We chose it really deliberately. Never have looked back, never regretted it. I always just assumed that it was all working out the way it should. For years, contracts have not been very favorable. They've, they've been really low percent increases. You know, for my first six years here, I got a step increase, which was noticeable. Then I hit step 11 in my sixth year here because I'd already taught for five years when I came. And so for the last, um, is that 13 <coughs> years, I think, I haven't gotten anything but the little cost of living increase. And I've just, I'm really surprised to find out how far behind we are other people doing the same jobs we do. Even if we don't talk about how good we are, how different we are, just doing this job anywhere else is valued at a much higher, higher rate. And that just seems wrong. It seems like we're at a point where the city has money that it hasn't always had. And I know there's never enough to go around and do everything that needs to be done, but it feels like our turn. And I have not felt this way in this, in this, in, in such a strong way mm -hmm. in these 19 years. I have not come to this. It feels like our turn. And if we don't do it now, I don't know when. So I, I think I really, really beg of you to put your heads together and influence the, the people who can help make this happen. It matters a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, anyone else? Floor is open to anyone who wants to speak on any subject, by the way. <laughs> Although I imagine there's one that is on most people's minds. So, no? Anyone else? Okay. If there's no other public comment, then the council will convene and start our work. And for that, I'll ask for a roll of the council, please. And the other thing I'll ask, <coughs> if everyone is <coughs> Leaving uh, the council chambers, I'd ask you to kind of subdue your conversation so that we can work. So, thank you. Here. Present. Here. 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 We are all here. So, a couple of public hearing announcements. The first is. Announcement of public hearing, uh, this is 19043, that's the document number. National Grid, Verizon New England poll petition for Burt's Pit Road, petition 27859494 in accordance with the provisions of section 22, chapter 166 of the general laws. So the public hearing will be held on Thursday, uh, June 6, 2019 at 7.05 approximately, but not before that time, in the city council chambers, 212 Main Street, Northampton, on the petition of National Grid, Verizon New England to erect poles and wires upon, along, under, or across one or more public ways. Uh, again, that poll petition number, 27859494 for Burt's Pit Road. So that is our next council meeting. The other uh, public hearing that I'm announcing, and this will be announced as well um, in the newspaper as is required, relates to our uh, annual budget hearing. We expect to receive a budget message today from the mayor. Uh, so we're going to hold a budget hearing on two days um, from June 5th and 6th. So by order of the City Council, in accordance with Section 7.4 of uh, the Charter of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, the City Council will hold a public hearing to consider the proposed fiscal year 2020 budget. 
uh, commencing on Wednesday, June 5th at 7 o'clock here in the council chambers, again, 212 Main Street, Northampton. And then what we're going to do is we're going to hold it open and, and carry it over to the next day, which is Thursday, June 6, 2019, also at 7 o'clock here in the council chambers. And the city council will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. So. One question. Go ahead. Yes. Just regarding the hearings. Yeah. Do we know a schedule of departments? Maybe you were going to. That's what I was going to get to. Yeah. Great. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, so we have the department that we've invited five of the, I think, the, the major departments. Um, and do we have actually a schedule, a time for each one, or is just a, just a rough order? Those so five would, would those five be police? I'll let you so know. our administrative assistant to the city council knows far more than I know on every subject. So I would, can you help me out? School department, Department of Public Works, okay. police, fire, and social services and water. Okay. Thank you. And so are there any requests from other counselors to invite other departments? I think those are the salient, important departments to ask to attend. Okay. So those are the departments. And then on Thursday, we continue to have the public hearing, and the purpose is to have another opportunity for the public to come and speak themselves on the budget, too. Okay. Great. Uh, any one minute? Announcements from councilors this evening. Uh, Councilor Nash. Um, I have three. No, three things. Um, first, uh, the TPC for next week has been canceled for this month, just so people, members of the public, who were hoping to show up um, will be taking up um, TPC in June. Um, I have two things related to the TPC. One has to do with um, the PVTA um, will be holding a promotion for seniors to ride uh, the PVTA um, starting in July. If you have a um, if you have a senior ID from the PVTA, you're allowed to ride free. So it's a promotion to get more people uh, riding public transportation. The other thing is this fascinating idea for the Route 44, which is the Northampton's only route. Um, we have a lot of buses that uh, go between here and UMass and, e and East Hampton, but this is the route that services our city. And in the past, it operated in this crescent-type fashion that it would, um, and from beginning to end, it, it, it you'd make this circuit around town and it would take quite a while. What they've come up with is, uh, is a concept of a, of a loop that with buses running in opposite directions and they're going to be trying this out in the fall. That's the proposed start date. Um, if you have any interest in that, go on the, the PVTA website and you can contact people if you don't like the idea. But I, I think it's a really interesting concept. It'll really just kind of link all of Northampton in, in a new and different way. Thank you. Is that two or three? That's only first three. two. <laughs> okay. Two P two PVTA announcements. Oh, so five from you? Yes. Um, there will be a joint hearing with the planning board and legislative matters meeting on the twenty uh, third at seven o'clock in these chambers. Uh, we're going to probably I'm not going to presume, but probably refer about seven items relevant to short term rentals uh, for that discussion. And also, you'll recall we referred. At our last meeting, a series of marijuana-related zoning regulations as well. We promise it to be um, fun. <laughs> so if you have an opportunity to show, in, in, in this uh, joint hearing, we will not be expecting or anticipating the presence of the transportation parking chair, at least this time. Okay. So, um, also, um, I should probably give a report on uh, the Charter Review Committee. Now, I was not in attendance, actually, I missed that. <coughs> um, but uh, by reading the minutes, there was a, a presentation and a request from um, ACLU attorney and radio personality Bill Newman, who came and spoke about um, his concerns about how the Charter is written in the Division of Powers is a rather significant proposal. Um, uh, he had expressed that he felt that essentially the uh, council 
in our capacity as legislators and um, the uh, uh, fiduciary oversight that we are essentially rendered figureheads. He was trying to figure out a way he could um, recommend changing and modifying that to um, assign more authority to the council was, was his suggestion. Um, uh, and then, and, and then I, I think I did, I did give you an update about the, uh, um, the forum on the 30th of April where we discussed uh, right, yes. various proposals of elections. So those, there is my report. Great. <laughs> I, I thought the council's already dripping in enormous power as it is, but it maybe I'm wrong. It really depends on who you talk to, obviously, and, and who's doing the perceiving. Yeah. <laughs> um, good. So any other announcements? Oh, Councilor Klein. I have two. Um, the first one, I might be preempting the mayor here, but there is a forum on Wednesday, May 22nd. That's next Wednesday at the Senior Center. Um, at 7 p.m. called Unlocking, Unlocking Opportunity and Assessment of Barriers to Fair Housing in Northampton. Um, it's co-sponsored by the Northampton Housing, Northampton Housing Partnership and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, and it will uh, include information from a report that was uh, developed about uh, barriers to fair housing in Northampton and how to um, address those issues. So that's one thing. Um, and the other is a member of the Board of Health asked me to make an announcement that they're holding a hearing uh, next week on Thursday, May 23rd at 5.30 at JFK Middle School. Um, they it's a public hearing to address a proposed ban on smoking um, in the downtown business district um, here in Northampton and in the center of Florence. Um, they will be taking a vote that night, so they'd like to hear from the public um, about this proposal. Those are okay. mine. Thank you. Anything else? <coughs> so it's it, except for our, our budget hearings, which again are Wednesday, June 5th, and Thursday, June 6th at 7 o'clock right here. Great. Um, so hearing no other <coughs> announcements, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, you're here, and I believe you have a communication for us this evening. And some light reading as well. <laughs> So good evening, uh, City Councilors. Good evening. Um, as uh, accordance with the Charter, I'm doing two things this evening. I'm presenting you with the um, fiscal year 2020 uh, proposed city budget, um, which uh, is technically due to you by tomorrow, I believe. But since you had a meeting tonight, it seemed like a good a good time to do it. Um, and then I've also prepared a budget message, um, which is also uh, required as part of submitting the budget. Um, and I was going to present that to you as I try to customarily do uh, this time of year. So, uh, again, obviously dated May 16th, uh, to the honorable members of the City Council. I submit for your consideration and approval my proposed $116,831,202 fiscal year 2020 budget to the City of Northampton, for the City of Northampton, in accordance with Article 7, Section 7 3 of the Charter. <coughs> The budget is comprised of a $100,462,057 general fund, together with four enterprise fund budgets for water, $7,280,000, sewer, $6,490,000, solid waste, $602,659, and stormwater and flood control, $1,996,486. This budget proposal represents a 4.4% increase over the current FY 2019 City of Northampton budget, expiring on June 30th, 2019. Six years ago today, Northampton was facing a $1.7 million funding shortfall, 
and the FY 2014 budget I proposed to City Council on May 16, 2013, recommended significant cuts to city and school services, including the elimination of over 15 staff positions in education, public safety, and public works. As I explained in the budget message that year, the ongoing structural imbalance between increased fixed costs and a lack of sufficient revenues to fund them did not allow the city to maintain its current level of staff or services. In the face of these difficult cuts, we presented Northampton taxpayers with both a choice and a multi-year plan, of which I highlighted in the FY 2014 budget message. Quote, on June 25, 2013, the residents of Northampton will have the final say as to whether these significant cuts are implemented. This city council approved a special municipal election for that date, seeking resident approval for the city of Northampton to raise an additional 2.5 million in local tax revenue above the limits of Proposition 2.5. If adopted, we would have the revenue capacity to close our FY 2014 budget gap and restore and maintain level services over the next four fiscal years." Unquote. The voters of Northampton did indeed have their say that June. The override passed, and our city implemented what has come to be called the Fiscal Stability Plan. The original plan called for filling our immediate budget gap, putting unused override funds into a Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund in FY 2014, 2015, and 2016, and then using those monies to fund the 2017 budget. Our projections at the time showed that the FY 2018 budget would need either another operating override or significant budget reductions to be balanced. We worked hard to adhere to our plan and updated it annually with revised revenue and expenditure forecasts as part of each new city budget. The good news is that we have been able to extend the original four-year fiscal stability plan to a seven-year fiscal stability plan due to a host of factors, including greater than anticipated new growth, higher than projected building permit and motor vehicle excise revenues, significant cost savings in health insurance through our membership in the state's GIC plan. Seven years of budget stability has allowed us to both maintain our city and school staffing while making targeted staff increases to serve critical needs. Since FY 2014, through this proposed FY 2020 budget, we've been able to add 53.27 full-time equivalent teachers and other licensed staff in the Northampton Public Schools, which has resulted in one of the lowest student-teacher ratios of any district in our area. During the same time period, we've been able to add 5.88 full-time equivalent city staff to enhance services or meet new needs in areas such as information technology, public health, senior services, and public works. The Fiscal Stability Plan has also allowed us to rebuild vital reserve funds depleted during previous recessions, both increasing our financial flexibility and resulting in an upgrade of Northampton's bond rating to AAA, which was affirmed once again late last week by Standard & Poor's. This fiscal discipline has in turn allowed us to make critical investments in our city and school buildings, equipment, vehicles, technology, paving, and other infrastructure through the five-year capital improvement program. We've also made quality of life investments, resulting in new and improved parks and playgrounds, additional open space and rail trails, more affordable housing, expansion of hours and facilities improvements at our libraries, hundreds of new plantings and enhanced maintenance of public shade trees, investments in climate initiatives, including renewable energy, bike share, and climate resiliency and regeneration as well as a host of other initiatives while maintaining a competitive tax rate that allows us to retain and attract new businesses. This is the good news about how we took control of our own fiscal destiny and were able to achieve and maintain relative budget stability for seven fiscal years. The less than good news, however, is that we did so knowing that our stability was, by design, temporary and that we would one day be back facing the same decisions we faced in 2013. A key aspect of the Fiscal Stability Plan was stabilizing our local city finances while lobbying the governor and legislature to address some of the major structural issues with our state funding, particularly as it pertains to education. As the end of our fiscal stability approaches, however, 
we are still waiting for reforms to the Chapter 70 Education Foundation budget formula created in 1993 that fails to account for the true costs of special education, health insurance, and other school costs, and underestimates the price tag of educating Massachusetts children by at least a billion dollars. We are still waiting for full funding of charter school tuition mitigation as per the law that created charters. We are still waiting for larger reforms to the flawed charter school funding model that continues to drain <coughs> a disproportionate amount of education funding away <coughs> from local districts to educate a small subset of students at schools that are not representative of the communities they draw from. In other areas of municipal finance, we are still waiting for long overdue increases in state chapter 90 funds to improve our roads, bridges, and sidewalks that have been level funded for nine out of the last 10 years. We are still waiting for income tax reforms like the fair share amendment or millionaire's tax needed to increase state revenue fairly and progressively <coughs> while taking pressure off of local property taxes. <coughs> While there has been increased attention on Beacon Hill to issues like education funding reform, none of the three pending versions of the state budget offered by the governor, house, or senate would provide significant new education funding for Northampton or needed relief from the drain of rising charter school tuition. The House version of the FY 2020 state budget on which the revenues for this Northampton budget are based actually represents a net decrease in state aid of $27,370 over what the city received in FY 2019. One positive source of new local revenue has been the emerging Massachusetts adult use marijuana industry that saw its historic launch here in Northampton on November 20th, 2018. As one of only a handful of communities with a licensed retail store opened by the end of 2018, our city benefited from a significant share of the first quarter of local option excise tax. There are now 18 marijuana retailers open statewide including nearby East Hampton, Greenfield, and Amherst. The Cannabis Control Commission has another 97 completed retail applications under active review with more partially completed applications in the queue. So it remains to be seen what Northampton's ultimate market share of adult use marijuana sales will be by the time our FY 2020 first quarter installment of marijuana excise tax is issued at the end of September. Based on special guidance from the Massachusetts Department of Revenue, we are using what we believe is a conservative revenue estimate of 1.2 million in marijuana excise to build this budget. This new local revenue source is a critical component of the $4,464,013 in revenue needed to cover what are predominantly fixed cost increases to our general fund. The largest single portion of that increase is the proposed appropriation to the Northampton Public Schools which will increase $1,339,782, or 4.5% over the current year amount. This would represent the largest percentage increase to NPS in six years, and is $301,137 higher than the budget approved by the Northampton School Committee in April. I am recommending this increase above the approved NPS budget in order to support a new collective bargaining agreement with school employees that is still under negotiation. It is important to also note that my administration is still in active collective bargaining with five out of the seven city employee unions. While current and pending contractual salary obligations to city and school employees make up a significant portion of any municipal budget, there are other fi fixed cost increases in the FY 2020 general fund, including required increases of $475,143, or 8.16%, to meet our retirement system assessment, a $332,033, or 2.9% increase in employee health insurance, an increase and an increase of $89,815, or 1.5% in debt service, primarily related to a $2.5 million investment in paving, and a $46,251, or 5.48% increase in Medicare taxes. All told, fixed costs account for the vast majority of the increases detailed in our FY 2020 budget, with only a small portion of funds in both the city and school budgets targeted for investments in personnel or equipment <coughs> needed to serve the needs of our residents and school children. This budget is the second one in a row that
that requires us to use override revenues from the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund in order to balance the budget. In FY 2019, we used $277,850 from the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund, and in FY 2020, that amount almost triples to $775,874 to meet our general fund revenue requirement. We have updated the Fiscal Stability Plan for FY 2020, and our projections show that without major changes in state or local revenue, we will completely exhaust the remaining $1.8 million balance of our stability fund for the FY 2021 budget, but still face an estimated deficit of $838,589. This is the not so good news I referred to earlier, and it is the same structural imbalance catching up with us that I referred to in that fateful budget six years ago when we first presented our multi-year plan. So where do we go from here? The first step is to meet our obligations for the new fiscal year that begins in 45 days by putting in place a budget for FY 2020 that maintains our excellent high quality city and school services. The next step will be to face our financial future head on and have a community conversation about whether we renew our fiscal stability plan with another general override or instead make the tough decisions that will be needed to scale down those city and school services to match revenues that cannot keep pace. Our past practice in Northampton, like many other cities and towns, has been to put a Proposition 2.5 override question on a special election ballot in late <coughs> spring, just before the beginning of the new fiscal year. This often involves presenting a recommended budget with cuts in city and school services needed to close the gap, with the outcome of the override question determining whether those cuts will happen. I propose an alternative approach. My compact with the taxpayers back in 2013 for the FY 2014 operating override was the explicit understanding that our fiscal stability plan would only provide a limited number of years of stability and then we would need to decide whether or not to renew it with another. I've made a point of reminding taxpayers of this fact in every subsequent budget message and at all of the many town hall budget meetings I've held every year since 2013. After we've completed closing out the current FY 2019 budget later this summer and move into fiscal year 2020, I will work with the finance director to develop a plan for renewing the fiscal stability plan that will include a proposition two and a half general override question. In early September, I will ask the city council to place that question on the ballot for the upcoming Northampton city election on November 5th, 2019. This will allow the taxpayers to make an important fiscal choice for FY 2021 and beyond as early as possible to inform our annual budget writing process that begins in January each year. <coughs> Please know that I do not take this step of proposing another override lightly and have worked day and night with our financial team, department heads, employees, and the city council to forestall it for as long as possible. I am committed to making the case that we must preserve our city and school services and will go out across Northampton this fall to explain our new multi-year override plan to voters and any group or organization that will give me an audience. I want to thank Finance Director Susan Wright for her outstanding work on this budget and her long and trusted stewardship of our city's finances. Thank you to our city department heads and school superintendents for working to develop fiscally responsible budgets for their individual organizations. Thank you as well to my Chief of Staff, Lynn Simmons, Mayoral Assistant Court Klein, and Executive Assistant Annie Lesko for their invaluable contributions to putting this annual budget document together. I look forward to working with the City Council over the next several weeks to answer any questions about this budget or provide additional information it may need. Copies of budget documents are available for residents to review at our two libraries and at City Hall, as well as electronically on the city's website. Respectfully submitted, David Jane Arkowitz, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that very detailed budget message. And for the budget, which I know all the counselors will review very closely uh, before our, we hold hearings on, on the budget. So thank you for today. Um, 
No resolutions tonight, but we have another important financial matter also required by the Charter. Um, the Charter requires the City Council to provide for an outside audit of the City Council's finances. And for that purpose, we select a uh, CPA or a firm of CPAs to do that audit. <coughs> this evening, we have uh, Representative of Scanlon Associates ask you to come on up. And um, this is a presentation about the FY 2018 independent audit. So I won't waste any more time. I'll, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and, and your work. Thank Hello. you for being here. Uh, my name is Jeff Jandron. I work for Scanlon Associates. I'm here to talk about the 2018 audit. Um, I do have two more copies, I think, uh, hard copies if anyone else wants one. Uh, if not, you know, I'll, I'll start right in. Please do, yeah. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is just what is an audit? Um, the audit, the objective of the audit is to give an opinion on the town's financial statements, and that's the big report here. It's uh, 85 pages, so it's a lot of reading, um, and that's our goal. Um, the auditor's responsibility is to plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements um, are free from material misstatement due to either um, error or fraud. The purpose of an audit is not to look for fraud, uh, to search for fraud. The purpose of the audit is to give an opinion on the accuracy of the financial statements. Um, so then it becomes, well, what do we do? What do we, how do we do this? So uh, typically you come here, we book a room for two weeks. That's when a majority of the field work happens. Um, before we come, we get electronic reports from the city auditor, um, treasurer collector's <coughs> office that's also here as well, <coughs> give us some documents, and we'll, we'll be able to prep some of the stuff we get before we get here. Um, we take a risk-based approach to the audit. Um, so we give internal control questionnaires to the financial team members, the treasurer collector's office, uh, the city auditor, the assessors, and we look at what they're putting in. Basically, it's a, what do you do? What's your policies, your procedures? Take a look at that. Um, gives us, you know, gives us some areas to focus on. We look at their responses. It's one thing to say what they do, but we also test, are they actually doing what they say in, in those questionnaires? Um, and from there, we do a, a series of tests, um, analytical, and we compare, you know, last year's versus this year's. We also compare the budget amounts to what actually occurred, and that drives us to which departments we're going to look at every year. Um, basically, there's certain departments we will look every year because of the significant amount of money that they're handling. Uh, the treasurer's office is handling all the cash investments. Um, the tax collector is handling all your receivables, all your tax revenue. So those two departments we're always going to look at extensively. Then we'll review some of the other uh, changes from year to year, <coughs> pick a handful of departments, which will typically be outside of this building. Um, the school department is being one of your largest expenditure-driven departments. We'll always go to the school department, go to public works, look at the Chapter 90 program, um, and then we'll vary it up from year to year. Um, and I think this year we, we did look at the police department, public works, and we, we went to both schools, uh, the administration building here, also went to Smith Volk, looked at the tuition uh, revolving account, <coughs> uh, things like that. <coughs> so yeah, so there's three reports, like I, I referenced the 85 page one here, the, the big one. So the first thing to, to look at really is on page three um, is the opinion. So we, we said we based our whole audit to give an opinion so on page three, yeah, right there towards the bottom, first there's kind of the responsibilities of management, there's the responsibilities of the auditor, then there's the opinion. What do we give, you know, the opinion? We gave an unmodified opinion, which is the best opinion you can have. Tom likes to call it uh, the gold standard. That's what everyone's searching for, and that's what the city's got. So that's, you know, that's, you know, the first thing to take from the report. Uh, the next part is really on page 16 and 17 when you start looking into the statements. Um, the statement of net, pit, net position starts on page 16. Um, these two statements are really more for accountants, 
Um, I don't know how much you guys will get out of it. it it's They're full of cruel. They're almost similar to what you'd see a business produce. So it's a little bit different, you know, than, than the, um, the day-to-day operations. Those will come later. But there is a couple things to note, a couple things you guys can take from here um, that are important. So way down the bottom of page 16, where it says net position, and then unrestricted, in brackets, there's a negative $186 million. And that's, that's you never want to see a negative in your unrestricted or, or fund balance. You never want to see a negative number. Um, and there's two components that really make up that $186 million. Uh, the first is your net pension liability, which is uh, $42 million, which you can see um, in the liability section under non-current. It's $42 million, and, and the net pension liability means retirement. So that, that's all your, you know, how much you are behind on fully funding your retirement. Um, but you do have a funding schedule, um, and you're not alone. All communities in Massachusetts are behind in that. And, you're, you know, you're, as you go, you're catching up. So that, there's that one. And then the OPEB, which is Other Post-Employment Benefits, which is basically uh, health insurance for retirees. And no one really started thinking about this or funding it till three to five years ago. And once again, everyone in the state is really behind on that. Now, the difference with OPEB is you, you do not have to fund it. It's not like the retirement. There's no law out there yet, and that's something that may happen in the future. Um, and then a couple things uh, with the OPEB. You guys contributed 375000 to the trust this year, uh, giving you a, a total of uh, $837,000, um, which is a start to get that OPEB trust going, which means that you guys are aware of it. It's, it's a good sign. Um, and then ac also, as well, the actuary, when the liability was created this year and they did their update, uh, there was a plan that was provided to increase the amount of funding, $50,000 a year, um, starting I think at 250,000 escalating up, 50,000 a year. So that was, the actor was able to give you a higher discount rate this year than last year. So they moved it from 3.5% to 4%. And by doing that, they reduced the liability 15 million. There's some other factors in there. So the, so the liability itself didn't change exactly 15 million, but that, that one aspect of the uh, actuarial assumptions made did lower your liability, $15 million. So those are the entity-wide statements, which are full of cruel, long-term, give you everything. And then more importantly to you guys probably is the governmental uh, statements, which are can be found on page 17, uh, page 18 and 19, excuse me. And on the bottom of uh, the general fund on page 18, there's unassigned, which means you have $15 million in unassigned. And that's a component of your free, cap, free cash and stabilization. So free cash right now was $4.2 million, and stabilization was $9.4 million for a total of $13.6 million. And also sitting there is your overlay, because the state kind of deducts the overlay when they come up with the free cash calculation, whereas for gap purses, purposes it's in there so roughly right now you have 13.6 million dollars in reserves um, and you have a budget of approximately 90 million dollars so that's giving you about a 15 percent in uh, reserves compared to your original budget for the past year um, anything over 10 percent is good it's you know 15 percent is strong and that's part of the reason why when you just had your you know your bond rating um, it was AAA, it was affirmed at AAA as the mayor uh, attested to earlier. Um, and that's something I, I remember coming to a meeting, it was with FinCom, with Tom, and you know, one of the counselors, I believe someone sitting over there had said, well, we're at AA plus, and this is back in, I think, uh, May of 2013, we're at AA plus, how could we get to AAA? And me not knowing as much back then or not knowing, I was sitting you know, right there and just kind of said, oh, yeah, that's a good thing. I wrote a note down afterwards. I asked Tom, I said, yeah, how could you get to AAA? And he explained, to, uh, just like he did at the meeting, and he was explaining to me, and I said, well, it seems like it'd be almost impossible. And he said, well, it's not impossible, but it's not very easy. And basically, 
Um, that's what you've done here. And a big factor of that is the policy, the reserve policy that you guys have in place that, um, you know, I think when we did the audit, I got a copy from Susan, uh, the finance director, sorry. And she gave me that. And it's great to have the policy in my hand and, and read through it and say, okay, this is what you plan to do. But the city actually had did it. You know, they have done it. And, and to steal a couple things from the bond rating, um, one of the quotes is just that the city has strong budgetary flexibility and in the past, you know, added to the reserves over the past several years. So those are two of the highlights out of the bond rating. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's ba basically speaks to, you know, how good the financial team has been doing. Um, so the next page I wanted to talk about was page 22. So in talking with Tom, kind of look at this, and this is really what they call budget versus actual. It's non-GAAP, so we don't do any accruals. We don't do any adjustments. It's really what you guys can control in here or the, or the budget. So how, how are you doing? You, you know, you propose this budget, but what, what really goes on with, you know, the city at the end of the day? And um, I told Tom, you know, so is this the one page we're going to take out of 85 pages? Is this the one page you'd rip out? He said this was the most important page, but he said with the caveat that, Tw page 22 with 18 and 19, the ones we just talked about. So he wouldn't let me get away with saying, just rip this one page out, and that's all you need to know. So he wouldn't quite say that, but he did say this is probably the most important uh, page in the audit report. Um, and just to go over a couple quick highlights, this kind of really breaks down and shows you where your free cash is coming from, okay? So in last year, you had approximately $4.2 in free cash. You voted it out almost all of it, but of that, I think 1.5 um, million, you voted into the stabilization, so you really just kind of moved it from free cash to another reserve, so that was, you know, a good policy, which I think is in the, res you know, the policy that Susan gave me to maintain um, the reserves at, at a good level and then use those for capital uh, items, not, you know, operational, which is uh, sound fiscal practice. Um, and then from there, that basically started you off at scratch, you know, you're back to where you started from. And if you look at the variance with final budget column way to the right, you can see in revenues, you had two million, and in expenditures, you also had two million to get to you to the 4.505. So that's basically saying where'd you, that's your new free cash. You basically got it half from revenues, half from expenditures. And if you go down and look at the individual line items, there's no huge jumps and there was no one-time revenue that came in that really, you know, jumped up your free cash that you're going to get this one year, but you're not going to get next year. So it was basically really evenly spread between all categories and all classes of revenue and expenditure. Um, and then the only other thing which I don't really have in the report is the collection rate, which is basically when you mail out your bills, what percentage is tax collector bringing in as revenue? And you're at 98.2% which is very strong. Um, so that means there's not a lot of people <coughs> not paying their tax bill. There's not a lot of people going into tax title. And, and the ones that are are actually uh, being paid as well. So you don't have a very large tax title balance. So that tells you that, you know, you're doing a great job between, you know, the treasurer, uh, treasurer tax collector side and the assessor side as well. There's not a large, large amount of abatements that were issued in the past year. Um, and that's pretty much all I have on that report. If anyone has any questions. Um, yeah, thank you. Do you want to turn it open to questions just for yep. a second? Uh, so, uh, Councilor Dwight. The, um, however, there was, and I don't know, this probably predates the report, there was a big leap <coughs> in some revenue recently, of course, in the, the quarterly marijuana payout base that we have 750,000, or 747, I think, something like that. Um, is, is, that's, 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 that wasn't part of your calculus. That was not reflected, yeah. Right. So I don't know when that first payment came in. It, uh, 2019. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is 2018. What? This is, this yeah. is yeah. No, thank you, <laughs> 2019. Right, so we, but it is, it is worth noting that but, um, our, our, pro our next audit will probably reflect that and whatever diminishing right. returns of that would be. But um, just, and maybe it's an unfair position to put you in, but can you 
speculate what kind of impact that would have on your, on your type of sport? I don't know that there's any restrictions. I know I've seen it in a couple of places since we haven't audited yet. I don't know if there's any restrictions, if someone else can answer that. You know, some places there's two versions of that, and, you know, there's a, a like a host fee, then there's right. sales, and I don't know if some of it has to be earmarked for certain services or not, or if it's all general fund money. At this point, I'm not exactly Actually, sure. Yeah, so we're still working on that, so that's – okay. But, uh, fair enough. It was, it's not an appropriate question at, at this time, so. Any uh, – Councilor Bidwell, please. Uh, yeah, th uh, thank you for the report. Mm -hmm. um, the $186 million of unrestricted net position. Yes, correct. Uh, 42 of that was unfunded retirement. Yes. What, what was, what's the makeup of the balance of that 186? I, I oh, sorry. It was 42 of the retirement yes. retirement piece and then one, one uh, is it 140 of OPEB. The OPEB. The OPEB. Oh, one, one, okay, that was yeah. The, the, the whole remaining 140 was the OPEB. Sorry, 155 is OPEB. And that's also on that page above okay. as well. If we go there. Uh, to page 16. <coughs> okay, I, 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 I got you. Yeah, so right above the net pension liability, <coughs> $2 million in the non-current liabilities right. is the 155 yep. okay. of OPEP. That's fine. I got you. And another thing to note on the retirement liability, you guys had a great year, investments over there at the retirement system, so I think you earned 20%. So that number <coughs> really did drop this year too, which is going to kind of fluctuate with the market, but you did have a great year. And 18. You're saying with regard to that $155 million OPED, uh, it's likely to become law in the future that there would be a required way of uh, It's possible. I, I, a schedule to deal yeah, with I don't want to mislead you. I'm just saying it's a possibility. I've heard that talked about at conferences I go to, but no, it's not. As of now, it's not. Any other members? Oh, uh, Director Wright. Yeah, I just wanted to add the, um, the long-term plan for the OPEB liability is that once we reach full funding for the retirement system, which right now is 2035, that we would, at tw once we reach full funding in the retirement system, we no longer have to make a contribution to the retirement system. 2035, that will be upwards of 10 or $12 million a year. So what we will do at that point is shift that contribution that comes out of our regular operating budget into funding o the OPEB liability. In the meantime, we're working, every budget that um, you've had since 2015 has had a line item for OPEP, so we are slowly right. ramping up our contribution out of our general fund budget. But the long-term plan is to take the money that's being used to bring the retirement system to full funding and then shift that to OPEP, so. You should write it to that Paul Feinstein report. <laughs> 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 I, I can hardly wait. <laughs> Their space dollars. Um, who else? Any member of the council want to ask a question? Uh, chair of the finance committee? Or? No, but you have more. You have more audits. More audits to go through. Yes, you yes. do. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's that's our big one. Um, the next report, I think, is 16 pages, 13 pages, and that's the audit of uh, federal awards and. If that's one that trigger, triggers an audit. I mean, you're probably also triggered by borrowing covenants, continuing disclosure of debt, but also as well, any community <coughs> that gets over $750,000 of federal awards has to, is required to get a, an audit, and they call that single audit. Um, and in this report, there's only a couple things to really take from, um, if you go to page 11, gives you the total amount of all federal expenditures you had during the year. So you had roughly a little bit under $6 million in federal expenditures. From all, and this gives you all the departments of the federal government that you receive money from, breaks it down. There's even a catalog number. And there's, it's tested and there's a separate compliance um, supplement that we have to follow to test on each one that we, we select. We don't select all $6 million. There's a matrix where you go through and select uh, whatever ones, you know, are considered major programs and there's low risk versus high risk. There's a, a lot of things that go into it. And then on page 13, you see the three major programs that were tested. Um, there is the community development block grants, which 
typically is so large that it'll get tested every year. Um, U.S. Department of Education, the special education cluster, another very large program that gets audited most years. And then the third one, which was a newer <coughs> program, was uh, Department of Transportation, and I believe that was the Valley Bike Share um, that was tested this past year as well. Um, and there was no material weaknesses or any findings. So, uh, you know, the grant management was solid. There was no issues that, that we found when we tested it. So we gave, you know, once again, it was another clean opinion. <coughs> and if there's any questions on that. That sounds like it falls into the no news is good news category. Most. And then the last one is the uh, management letter. And I think that's seven pages. give or take, and there's really not much in here. All the prior year's findings, um, you know, the staff and everyone that we talked to, when we relay this to them, this is what we found. They've been very good at following up, trying to get uh, all the items rectified and moving forward. So it's, it's a good, it's a nice management report to write because then the next year I can remove those after we've, uh, it's been taken care of. Good, and so that's, that would be the management letter. And so is that probably the final component that you would like to present on? Yes. Okay. If there's um, any questions. Yeah, any further questions on any of that? Um, well, I, I'd like to thank you, I think, if I sort of just alluded, <coughs> you know, we're sort of scanning for um, red flags, and I don't really see any red flags, and that has a lot to do with our great finance director and uh, administration of our finances in the city. Um, and I think that Northampton, like many communities, as you point out, is dealing with a lot of major issues that are just <coughs> struggling to, uh, to take stock of them and do the best we can. But I feel that the city's finances are doing that and are, are managing those challenges well. And I think it's reflected in this, in this audit. Um, that's my opinion. So thank you thank for helping us, fulfilling what we need to do under the charter. And uh, thanks for your continued work and for being here. Well, thank you. Okay. All right, <clears throat> now we're at the consent agenda. Um, the consent agenda contains the following things. At the request of any counselor, I will remove an item for a separate vote. Otherwise, there's no discussion on the consent agenda. Uh, first, the minutes of May 2nd, 2019. Um, next, a number of appointments, which I'll confirm with the chair of the Committee on City Services are all for referral. Yeah. So vote on these would be equivalent to sending them to city services. Um, all these appointments run from July 2019 until June 2022. And so to the Community Preservation Committee would be Linda Morley of 244 Prospect Street, Northampton, to the Housing Partnership, Patrick Bowen of 25, uh, 95 Straw Avenue in Florence, <coughs> uh, as well as Alexander Jarrett to the Housing Partnership. Um, he is of eight High Street in Florence. Um, next, uh, also to the Housing Partnership, Gordon Shaw of 582 Haydenville Road in Leeds. To the Planning Board, Tess Perone Poe of 32 Masonic Street, number four. And finally, to the Whiting Street Fund Committee, Michael Quinlan, uh, 712 Bridge Road in Northampton. Is a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? Sure. Have, I think you have one more item under the, the application. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. I jumped <coughs> the gun. Uh, the final item is 19080, an application for a secondhand dealer license for Birdhouse Music. Renewal license for Sun Music LLC doing business as Birdhouse Music, 164 Main Street. The petitioner is Glenn Alper. And so now, no removals? Okay, is there a second to approve? Second. Second? Okay, all those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Oppose the abstention, so that is all approved. Now we will recess for the Finance Committee. Thank you. Laura, would you call the roll of finance, please? Here. Present. <coughs> Here. Thank you. The first item is the approval of minutes of May 2nd. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, so for financial orders, uh, the first order is 19075. It's an order to authorize borrowing of $15 million for electrical and process upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant. And I'm waiting for this for a while. Uh, order that whereas 
in 2016, the city finalized its comprehensive wastewater management plan, which was an evaluation of existing conditions and future needs for its wastewater collection system and wastewater treatment plant that included, includes a capital improvement plan to prioritize its most critical needs. And whereas the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust is a state agency that improves water quality and infrastructure throughout the Commonwealth by providing low interest loans to municipalities and the city applied for and received approval for inclusion in the 2019 um, intended use plan, which details the projects, borrowers, and amounts to be financed through the Clean Water State Revolving Loan Program. And whereas the city is required to comply with all the provisions of the municipal, federal, and state water pollution statutes enforced by the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection included, but not limited to 33 U.S.C. Section 1251, Mass General Law Section 21, Sections 26, uh, Chapter 21, Sections 26 through 53, the Surface Water Discharge Permit Regulations, um, CMR 314, um, the Groundwater Discharge Permit Regulations, um, 314 CMR 5, the Sewer System Extension and Connection Permit Regulations, um, 314 CMR 7, and the operation and maintenance and pretreatment standards for wastewater treatment works and the indirect discharges that um, 314 CMR 12. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $15 million is appropriated for the purpose of financing the construction of electrical and process upgrades to the city's wastewater treatment plant, including all costs incidental and related thereto, <coughs> and without limitation, all costs, therefore, as defined in Section 1 of Chapter uh, 29 of the general laws as amended and that to meet the appropriation, the treasurer with approval of the mayor is authorized to borrow $15 million and issue bonds or notes therefore under any enabling authority including chapter 44 section 7 or 8 of the general laws or chapter 29C of the general laws as amended uh, that such bonds or notes shall be uh, general obligations of the city unless the treasurer with the approval of the mayor determines they should be issued as limited obligations and may be secured by local system revenues as defined in section 1 of chapter 29C of the general laws as amended. The treasurer with the approval of the mayor is authorized to borrow all or a portion of such amounts from the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust established pursuant to uh, chapter 29 as amended and in connection uh, therewith to enter into one or more loan agreements and or security agreements with the trust and otherwise to contract with the trust and the Department of Environmental Protection with respect to any such loan and for any federal state aid available for the project or for the financing thereof that the mayor is authorized to enter into one or more projects regulatory agreements with the Department of Environmental Protection to expend all funds available for the project and to take any other action necessary to carry out the project, any premiums received by the city upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this order, lest any such premium applied to the payments of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this order in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, uh, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by like amount. Do we have a motion in finance? Motion. Second. Second. And uh, the mayor is here to so, tell us um, about this. The, the, the um, order is somewhat self-descriptive, but as the council knows from working with um, Director La Scalia on the capital plan and on obviously on the sewer enterprise budget and setting the sewer and water rates over the last several years, we are on the verge of making some significant investments in the um, wastewater treatment plant on Hockenham Road. We've been planning for them and gearing up for them and doing a lot of the design work. Um, we've done some uh, raises in our rates to prepare for that. And um, one of the funding sources that we um, are wanted to avail ourselves of is this Clean Water Trust, which is administered by DEP. Um, it gives essentially gives out um, low interest loans for these kinds of municipal water projects. Um, we were able to use a similar loan for the construction of the water treatment plant. Um, and so effectively, um, this allows us to borrow up to that amount. Um, and we did run it by our bond council, who we do sort of traditional borrowing through. Um, and they highly recommended that we go through the Clean Water Trust process. Um, they estimated we would save um, a, almost $2 million um, versus sort of conventional borrowing because it's sort of a subsidized 
program. Um, the interest rate they anticipate on that um, on that uh, borrowing is about 1.5 percent is what the the estimate we were given, um, and so uh, we need your authorization to move forward. We got a grant award, sort of a grant award letter, if you will, from DEP, um, congratulating us that our you know we, we we had applied and our project had been put into their list of um, various projects that they um, give out, uh, and um, and so we want your authorization uh, to do that. Our treatment plan. Uh, Councillor Skier. Um, as we've heard, there's concern that we spend money we don't need to. Could you talk about the third whereas section that talks about the regulations? I know we, we often talk about unfunded mandates and regulations that we need to adhere to. Can you give a little context to what that means and what happens if we are not? <coughs> yeah. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that um, <coughs> um, in the context of this discussion we had earlier, uh, this, these are funds that would be paid for out of the sewer enterprise fund. They would not be general fund dollars. That, so none of this um, would be paid for out of the general fund dollars that pay for um, city services or school services. By law, they can't be used for that. They can only be used for the utility from which the fees are collected. Um, and this is a loan program that can only be used for uh, water and sewer projects. So um, this is not $12 million that we could use to you know, fund something else or fund operating expenses. So that's number one. And then obviously you know from our work with the capital improvement program that you know, we have a um, wastewater treatment plant um, whose last major upgrades were in the 1970s um, and it's becoming more and more regulated uh, in terms of um, what we have to do to ensure that the, uh, essentially the sewage that we have to treat um, before it is released into the Connecticut River, because that's where our sewage goes. It's treated at the wastewater treatment plant, and then the water is eventually released into the Connecticut River. Um, has to meet increasingly high standards in terms of purification and testing. Um, and so, some of the upgrades that we've been working on um, include some, you know, basically some of it's just basic upgrades to. Uh, 1960s, 1970s era technology that is uh, both unsafe and, and outmoded. Um, and others are to install new kinds of um, purification systems that do meet those uh, new requirements. Um, so there's a whole long list and you've, well, you've seen it in the capital plan about just what's being you know, replaced from the different headworks for screening and grit removal, um, pretreatment uh, headworks, aeration tanks, um, hydraulic upgrades, sludge gravity thickeners, all kinds of things like, wonderful things like that. Um, and DEP, uh, you know, this is part of our license both with DEP and the EPA. Um, and so they um, have to recertify our plan um, and we have to, you know, get that permit renewed. Um, and so they have reviewed all of these documents and all of these upgrades um, to make sure that they are gonna comply with the various DEP and EPA regulations. So um, again, it's it's uh, it's it's a sort of a significant public health and, and um, sanitary um, operation that you know many citizens maybe take for granted when they flush their toilet or run something down the drain or run something through their um, uh, disposal. Um, but we have to treat it, um, and so that's what these investments are for. Yeah. So again, just to be clear, this is not money that is competing with general fund dollars. The debt service on it is not being paid with general fund dollars. It can only be paid with um, sewer enterprise dollars. So that's, I guess, a long answer to your question. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, uh, Counselor? What do you expect the term of this loan would be through the state program? That's a good question. I might ask. It's 20, 20 years. Okay, it's 20 years. 20 years. 20 years term is the max okay. that they allow us yeah basically have a 20-year plan for we do calling the white wastewater treatment plant so exactly that's no joke okay Interesting. yeah no, it's definitely uh it's a it's a, a big project that we're yeah. taking on um, but again it's something we have to do yeah um, good thank you Councillor bidwell uh c could you put this in the in the in a, in a timeline of 
how many how many more years before we see the uh, completion of this <coughs> round of very extensive upgrades? That's a good question. I think I'd want to. Do you have a sense of that, Susan? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have. The this fif this fifteen million is just phase one right. of what will need to be done there. And uh, Donna Lascalia, the director, anticipates that this fifteen million will be expended over the next two years. And uh, if you look at the capital plan, we also have um, additional projects of, I think, <coughs> 10 million. I'm going off the top of my head here. I think there's another 6 million. So it's a multi-phased, multi-year project. But in out years, um, we will be using some of the funds in the sewer stabilization fund to fund some of that as well. So we're, this will be a combination of borrowing and using funds that we've already set aside. Mm -hmm. But we are using doing the borrowing first because at 1.5 percent interest, it makes sense to do that now, and then in the future use our cash um, when interest rates, if they do rise, to take that, and also to make sure we're using the money in the stabilization fund also to make the payments in the debt schedule very level so that we don't have to have spikes in the rates that the rates can just smoothly, you know, um, move up. Um, as we go through this project, but it is a multi-year project. This is only <coughs> one phase of it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Klein. Does that mean that it's not a fixed rate? If we're talking about the the change in the if interest rises? No, I meant in future projects. Uh, oh. When we when we go <coughs> out to bond um, or or borrow for future projects, the Fed may raise interest rates, but. Oh, okay. but but this particular program is a fixed rate for the 20 years. Any other questions on this one? Oh, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> the, the next thing we have up is uh, budgetary transfers as we're winding down uh, fiscal year 19. And in the transfers total, um, and these are, again are all in the budget, they're just moving from one part of the budget to another is $2,295,983.55. So it, it may get a little confusing, but I'm going to tell you where it's going to and where it's coming from, uh, but the total is $2,295,983.55. And again, this is all things that are already, budget, already in one budget or another, and they're just moving around. So uh, in the city clerk's department, election workers are receiving $8,241. Permanent salaries is receiving $1,730. Uh, in central services, overtime is getting $5,500. Central services, salaries permanent, $3,525. The mayor's office, salaries permanent, $1,858. In the health department for overtime, $3,820. Um, from the salary reserve account, $24,600. And $74 is coming out of that to go in to fund some, some of these other things. Uh, in the IT department for software licenses, $41,358 is being transferred into that. Uh, information technologies salaries permanent, uh, the $41,358 is coming from there to go to the software licenses. Um, interest on municipal debt is getting $68,000 transferred into it. Uh, municipal indebtedness maturing principal, that's where the $68,000 is coming from that is going there. Uh, DPW roadway line painting, $24,943.89 is coming out of there, and that money is going to the highway department pavings and markings. So again, it's $24,943.89. Uh, highway department permanent salaries is being debited $4,325. That is going uh, to uh, DPW administration and engineering permanent salaries. Again, it was $4,325. DPW highway permanent salaries, $176,500 is being transferred out of that. Of that, um, one sixty-five dollars is going into forestry parks and cemeteries permanent salaries. Um, Snow and ice supplies is receiving $11,500. Highway Department waste wood uh, is transferring out $20,000. That's going to um, DPW wood waste disposal, 
$20,000. That's where it's going. A DPW highway site improvements is being debited $30,033.74. That is going over to site improvement trees. Again, it was $30,033.74. Um, wastewater treatment plant, architecture and engineering, uh, $255,761.14 is being taken out of that budget item. Um, DPW Wastewater Treatment Architecture and Engineering is getting that $255,761.14. Uh, wastewater Treatment Plant Computer Equipment is being debited $10,282.10, and they're using it to replace equipment technology, again, $10,282.10. DPW Wastewater uh, Treatment Electricity is being debited $1.00. That dollar is going over to maturing principal or sewer enterprise fund. Uh, on page two, um, Department of Public Works, Water Department, Architecture and Engineering is being debited $43,805. That is going over to Wastewater Treatment, Architecture and Engineering in another category, $43,805. Uh, DPW Water Computer Equipment, um, $13,000. $778.40, and that's going to be used to replace equipment technology. Again, $13,778.40. A DPW wastewater treatment part, granular activated carbon, $473,772 is being transferred out of that item, and it's uh, again going over to activated carbon, $40. $473,772. Um, DPW um, wastewater, uh, I guess that's wastewater treatment. Uh, that's water treatment. Water tre regular water treatment, not wastewater, but water treatment. Um, computer equipment, that's being debited, debited $49,975.75. Um, and also water treatment replacement of equipment technology is being debited $3,153.31. Um, they're using that uh, at water to replace some equipment technology, uh, $53,129.06. Uh, water treatment, replace control room measuring equipment. Um, out of that line item, line item, line item is coming $536,130.25. And that is going over essentially to the same thing, other than ordinary, ordinary maintenance to replace those uh, pieces of control and measuring equipment. Again, that was $536,130.25. Uh, wastewater, or not wastewater, but water treatment. Uh, electricity is being debited $1.64. And that's going over to interest on municipal debt. Stormwater architecture and engineering is being debited $63,042.94. Um, and that's going to be stormwater architecture and engineering for the same amount, $63,042.94. Uh, stormwater computer equipment is being debited uh, $6,979.60. And that's going to stormwater replacement of equipment and technology. $6,979.60. Stormwater storm drain inflow, it's a $100,000 amount, and that's going over to stormwater drain replacement in the amount of the $100,000. Um, stormwater catch basin cleaning is being debited $15,000. That's going to flood control over to, <coughs> again, $15,000. Flood control architecture and engineering is being debited, debited $89,680. Um, and that's going to wind up again in flood control architecture engineering for $89,680. Uh, flood control site improvements for $244,785.79. That's going to flood control levies still in the flood control area, $244,785.79. So the total transfer is from one budget item to another is two million two hundred ninety five thousand nine hundred eighty three dollars and fifty five cents. Do we have a motion to finance? Second. Second. That was incredible. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and uh, Susan can answer any questions about any of these line items. There's, th there's three things going on here. We're, we're shoring up some, s most of the smaller amounts are just shoring up accounts. Um, the DPW ones, uh, Director Lascalia has been re, over her tenure, has been redoing the budget formats. And wherever you see something going from OM to OOM, OOM is other than ordinary maintenance, that's capital, and those can be encumbered and carried forward. So she's just moving things. She also, we used to have two divisions at the waste, at the water treatment plant. There was water treatment and water operations. She has combined those into one budget. So some of these were just moving from the old two to two. If you look at the numbers, they're actually different. But I can assure you, everything with water enterprise is staying in water enterprise. Everything with sewer is staying in sewer. Um, it's just also with the um, creation of the forestry parks and cemetery division in the DPW, we moved things from highway to the new forestry division. So most of the stuff is DPW. It's all just internal housekeeping. You won't see these kind of transfers again next year because we're changing some of the way we do, do the budget. So for things that are <coughs> being transferred from one item to the same item, yeah. The move is from OM to OOM. Correct. So that the money will carry over to the next year to complete the task that wasn't finished this year. Right, okay. right. So the majority of those were just, they're just housekeeping. Housekeeping. So. Um, any, any other questions on in finance? Stuff? I, I would just opine for the record. I'm, I'm very supportive and enthusiastic about uh, uh, Director Lascalia's reorganization efforts at the DPW, including the creation of the department and the mayor as well. Um, both of you, your administration, I think that's a good approach. <coughs> so like to voice that. <coughs> so to, uh, to th that item, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> right. Um, and actually, <coughs> Councillor Dwight was mentioning uh, marijuana earlier. And <laughs> since it's now really in the budget, we got a couple orders on marijuana. Uh, this is 19077, order in order to establish marijuana community impact fee stabilization fund. Um, order that pursuant to chapter 40, subsection 5B of the Mass General Laws, the City Council hereby authorizes the creation of a marijuana community impact fee stabilization fund for the purpose of receiving and expending host community impact fees collected as part of the negotiated limited term host community agreement with both medical and adult use marijuana licenses. The funds will be used subject to appropriation to mitigate the impact of marijuana operations upon the city's road system, law enforcement, inspection services, permitting services, administrative services, and public health services, in addition to potential additional unforeseen impacts upon the city. Do we uh, have a motion to finance? Second. Second. So these are sort of two <coughs> separate orders that kind of go hand in hand. Um, and we're following some guidance we got from the Department of Revenue about what to do with this new, um, it's not a, it's not um, the excise tax gets collected at the point of sale and goes to the POR and comes back to us. So that one we kind of know how it works. The host agreement one is something that's negotiated. It's a five year agreement. Um, and there's a direct payment to the city. Um, and so one of the things they've suggested is that you can just establish a fund for it mm -hmm. um, and that if you adopt this and say, yes, we do want to establish this fund, and then the second vote is really just saying like, and then we want to put the revenues into the fund, um, that it's a place that we can keep it and it's sort of transparent and we <coughs> all in one place. Um, it can't be spent without an appropriation. Um, this just means it can be put in there um, and so um, then when we come back um, to you, uh, then we you know, would come back to you with appropriated uses for it over time. And you know, I'm, I'm mindful because we signed a host agreement that said that these were the things we were going to use it for. Um, and so we want to just, I want to be able to uh, you know, keep track of this money as it's come in, <coughs> keep track of how the money has gone out. And again, because it's a five-year short-term revenue that's going to not happen af uh, after five years, we don't want to treat it like it's a recurring general revenue. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the, what we're asking you to do. And um, we're slowly getting these different advisories from DOR about these things. And so this was one of the ones we were trying to figure out what to do with it. 
Um, so, and the other oddity of it is that you have to have adopted this by July 1st of the year that, before July 1st of the year in which you can and then accept it. Yeah. So for example, the other, the checks we've gotten so far are sort of just in limbo land, um, because we, we could, we, we, yeah, they just get, are gonna put in the general fund um, and then they'll just be flowing to free cash because they weren't budgeted. Um, but unless we could have gone back in time and established this fund back, you know, before July 1 of this fiscal year, we couldn't do it. So, um, so now we want to just be prepared and have this fund set up. And again, we at this point we only have one licensed um, uh, retail establishment in uh, Northampton. Um, and again, as others come into the queue um, and begin operating when that will be, um, you know, we have host agreements with them as well. So we would um, begin to see that happen as well. Mm -hmm. So our, our recurring marijuana income is going to the general fund. Yes. This is the host community uh, that's of a limited time and it's going into this reserve account. That is correct. So, and to come out of this account, we have to agree with you and vote the order to take it out. Exactly. So we'll all know where it went. When we some it. For a budgeted project or expense or something, which something we will try to tie one time things because it isn't recurring in community impacts on of this. So okay, and I'm Cons getting lots of suggestions from people. Yeah, already. Councilor Dwight. So. Well, a couple of things actually to that point, um, it would not be appropriate to apply these funds towards a salary, given the fact that contractual obligation would outlast the potential revenue. That is the concern. Yes, it's sort of like um, you know. Sometimes we, sometimes there are grant funded salaries, right. but then when the grant runs out, then you this either have to absorb position. that salary or the position goes away. Um, so that's the ch that's why we're trying to kind of keep these two things separate and not have the. Yeah. The the other thing is the host agreements don't only apply to retail systems, right? It's also they apply to uh, uh, yes. We have host agreements with uh, cultivators. We have um, with processors. Um, should should the state actually complete the the final uh, remaining issues, uh, like for instance, allowing for uh, uh, social social consumption, social yeah. consumption in in uh, uh, businesses, yeah. those two would also be subject to the host agreement. We we don't know, but we presume probably so. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we presume if it's incorporated into the existing law, probably so. And then I don't know about like point of sale, whether there'd be a an excise tax involved as well. I don't know. These are all sort well, of that's, uncharted that's true. That remains to be seen. Yeah. So they're talking about a pilot, and um, the governor seems to like a pilot. Um, yeah. And uh, so, uh, which means going really, really slow and, and at a glacial pace. So we'll see. But yeah, th that's definitely. Um, and we do have various types of um, licensees that have made applications in pretty much every category. Um, so, uh, so. It, again, it's just a matter of when they will ever get through the process. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So okay. these are five-year, these have a five-year five lifespan? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, for instance, net is five years started, but if a year from now another one commences, that five years continues. So yes. I don't want people to think yeah. that this account would only be funded for five years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because as new licensees appear, yes. their five years right. start. So exactly. it would could flow for quite a while as we get more licenses. It's quite possible. And um, the question, the, one of the open questions is whether it the, can be. the commission um, is going to start regulating these agreements, because I know they've been asking for that authority to regulate the agreements, because there's, there's some concern within the industry that the agreements are not really being well regulated and that impacts aren't really being demonstrated, and so we don't know what's going to happen. Um, yeah. Councilor Bidwell? Uh, two questions. Uh, the these five-year agreements, presumably they will be renewed, uh, or is stands or is it specify that it only covers the first five years? Um, it, it's an open question um, about that. Um, we think that it could be renewed, but it's an open question whether the, um, whether, because I mean the idea of the impact fee was that you've got this new industry that's coming to town mm -hmm. and there's going to be these new impacts, and so <coughs> You, this is going to be some additional funds to kind of mitigate these new impacts. Um, and so I've, um, I'm, most of the people that I talk to think that if, 
if it survives the first five years, if the mitigation fees survive even the first five years, it, like there's not a court challenge or there's not, um, it's highly unlikely that um, anyone will be able to collect something, you know, in year six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Um, so that's the that's the thinking out there. Um, so we're really treating this as a as a five year um, thing. So yeah. And then my second question is the the host fees that have come in in the last three years. Um, yeah. How how just refresh. My well, how have those been interesting handled enough, in the budget? The marijuana ones, um, because well, the, so the law changed midway through this process. So there actually wasn't a host community of fee agreement. There wasn't a host community agreement for medical. Um, there was no nomenclature. There was no requirement. There was no anything. Um, and so we, Meta actually voluntarily um, uh, negotiated something um, that basically went on ad infinitum, <coughs> sort, of like sort of like a pilot agreement of sorts. Um, but then the law changed. Um, and so we're actually in the process of sort of reworking that to fit within the framework. So it's now going to just have a five year. We, you can't sign a contract. You can't sign one of these longer than five years. And we had one that was just sort of a, you know, it was a just recited some things that, you know, we were going to do to communicate with each other and share information. And then it had an escalating um, agreement that went on. So we actually, for the first couple of years, have been using it as revenue. Um, we the general fund. Yeah, we were booking it as general fund revenue. The finance director has now moved it out of that, um, and and we're going to start treating it now because we know now that it's only going to have two more years. Um, and the law is actually retroactive, so it's not didn't start from the minute. So we're so so that one's gonna those will end in a, in another year and a half. Um, so that'll be your first example of a five year end. Um, so yeah, so we sort of midstream we've now switched that. Um, which means we also have to absorb that general fund revenue um, as well with some of the new uh, mar you know, retail revenue. But that's, that's what's happening with that one. So we actually, it's been spent in general fund just generally um, okay. because there wasn't this mitigation requirement or host community requirement that didn't exist, right. at least for medical. Okay. Yeah. And the medical's not taxed, obviously, so there's no excise tax either. So pretty much that one was just um, the state got what it got out of licensing fees. Right. Okay. Dr. Klein. Um, I know this is just to establish the fund, but um, when we're talking about impacts, I've gotten a couple questions from constituents about what, um, <coughs> how much, for instance, NETA has actually um, covered in terms of uh, shifts of police, law enforcement. Um, so. I'm just kind of wondering if you have a sense of how much, the, what the burden has been on the city, what the impact has been on the city, and how much Met, Meta is actually um, doing their own mitigation, as it were. So Net has definitely been doing a lot of their own mitigation directly in terms of um, renting parking um, in area lots all around them and making signage and doing, you know, outreach to the neighborhood. Um, they've also been paying for those um, off-duty officers on those details. Um, so they've been paying that themselves. So 100% of that yes, is covered yes, by Yes, we have not itself. covered any of that. Um, and it's important for people to know that, you know, the details that happen, those are officers that are not on duty. Um, those are off-duty officers who get hired through a whole system, uh, whether it's a paving company or it's the state or whoever it is, you know, doing, um, I mean, they're still sworn officers, but I'm just saying that they're, we're not taking officers off the street to go no stand in front of NETA. Yeah, the, the, no, the overtime passes through the city, um, th you know, we, and we pay it to them, but it, the money comes from whoever's hiring our off-duty officers. And that's just a customary practice in every, uh, in every community and department. Um, and especially, you know, at this time of year when there's lots of construction projects happening, that's, you know, it, it ramps up. So, yeah, they've been paying for all of that. Um, and so, you know, I did speak with you a little bit um, about the fact that um, one, of the, one of the things I was looking at for a couple of these installments um, uh, from NETA particularly was, you know, we just um, paved a number of road systems in and around 
the net of dispensary. Um, it was sort of just coincidental that we did it because we were doing, you know, sections of Pleasant Street, and so we did, you know, Hampton Avenue, um, we did Wright Avenue, we did Fulton Avenue, which is literally the street right in front of the dispensary. Um, so one of the things I've been um, talking with the DPW director about is that um, coming back to you when we have access to the funds and saying, could we credit the paving budget for the portion of those streets that are like right in front of them and that are taking a lot of traffic, frankly, because there's a lot of you know people parking and driving and and um, and that so that may be one thing when I talk about roadway impacts, um, and then if we end up having to do any um, additional uh, safety, uh, you know, crosswalks and and other kinds of safety measures. So that would be an example of of um, of how we might use this early piece of it. Um, I've obviously been talking with our public health department um, about some of the issues that they um, may want to pursue. Um, you may know that in the host agreement, there is a requirement that um, it's a voluntary, uh, it's a voluntary um, grant program to a not-for-profit um, in the community that they agree to give up to ten thousand dollars to a not for, not to the city, but to a not-for-profit, a nonprofit um, that is working on responsible use and you know youth prevention and things like that. Um, and I can, I guess I can tell you that um, the uh, uh, Prevention Coalition uh, recently applied for those funds um, and actually was uh, granted them by NETA. Um, and they are going to be doing a, um, a safe storage campaign, um, basically to patrons of NETA um, and giving them information on how to safely store and secure uh, the, your purchases so that they don't, so that children and uh, people under 21 don't get access to them, so they've been working with. So that's an example of, you know, a public health initiative that this may support. Um, and I know that the folks at the Prevention Coalition, um, I've heard from the Recovery Center, um, have expressed some interest in in um, ways that this um, mitigation fund. But again, I'm I'm also trying to make sure that we're tying it to actual impacts of the industry, um, and so that's going to be my my guide yeah oh, blue barge yeah mayor um is there any way that as a mayor you would know if other people have applied for licensing in the city oh yes yes um yeah because they have to come to me so how many um we on our if you go on our website right now we've got a list of all of them i think we've got about 13 applicants, but they're not all retailers. I want to be clear about that. We've got a nut, like for example, you've got you've got um, the uh, green, um, whatever the name of the company is, green, Exchange. healthy healthy green LLC, uh, which is now just you know, healthy, just healthy. You're right, just <laughs> healthy. Um, they are uh, they've actually got multiple licenses because they've got a license to cultivate both medical <laughs> and recreational, and they've also. I mean, they, they don't have a license, they've applied, mm -hmm. and they've also applied for a license to have a co-located medical and retail dispensary. Um, so that's like four right there. Um, I mean, they're required to have a medical dispensary as a condition mm -hmm. of the growing process. Um, we've got <coughs> a number of other uh, retailers um, that have made applications to the um, commission, um, and again, I. No one knows how long it may take, um, and whether those applications will actually be, you know, s successfully vetted and, and see the light of day. Um, but there are definitely other um, interested retailers, some who have who are growing in other communities. We have an example of a well, we had an example of a company that was going to be growing in another community and then um, doing a retail here in Northampton. They've actually just applied to the commission to switch to a different license. Um, that's the one in your ward on Pleasant Street. Um, but it, the, but there's a retail locate another retail location plan there. There's one out on North King Street. Um, so, th but again, it's unclear to me how long this is going to take because there you can sort of see they're sort of like doing one here, one here, one over there, one. You know, I haven't yet seen a community that's gotten more than one yet. I'm assuming they're trying to sort of spread them around. Um, so we don't know how long before 
they come back to Northampton with another potential retailer if they get through the process. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, other questions on, on this one? That's order. All right, then uh, all in favor and finance of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then the, um, the last one we have is 19078, an order to dedicate marijuana host community fees to the Marijuana Community Impact Fee Stabilization Fund. Order that the Northampton City Council accepts the fourth paragraph of Mass General Law Section 40, um, Section B, 5B, that allows the dedication without further appropriation of 100% of the host community impact fees collected as a part of the negotiated limited term host community agreements with both medical and adult use marijuana licensees to the Marijuana Community Impact Stabilization Fund established under Mass General Law Section 40, subsection 5B, to be effective for the for the fiscal year beginning on July 1st, 2019. Do we have a motion on this one? Make a motion. Second? Second. Okay, and this is just authorizing the money to go in the fund that we yeah. just recommended. They require two separate votes. I don't yeah. know why. Mm -hmm. It has to be two separate orders. So, so create the fund and then authorize the, the money to go into the money to go into the fund. Okay. So any questions on this one? I think we pretty much just covered it. Then hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I think that's the uh, the end of our finance agenda. The only the only thing I'd like to add is, is congratulate the mayor and finance director for a very clean <coughs> audit for for 18. <laughs> and uh, mm. congratulations and a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're back in the city council. We're going to go through these pretty fast. There are a number of financial orders on first reading. First is 19075 in order to authorize borrowing of 50 million dollars. Electrical and process upgrades to the wastewater treatment plants. Motion to approve this in first so reading. Second. And second. Any discussion on this financial order? There are none. Allows for a roll call. Yes. 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 That is approved on first reading. Next is 19076, an order for fiscal year 2019 budget transfers. Chair for second. And seconded. Any discussion on this financial order? Yes. 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 First reading. Do I hear a motion to spend rules to allow for second reading tonight? Uh, so moved. Is anyone second? Second. Seconded. Any discussion on the suspension of rules to allow for two readings? Uh, if not, all of those in favor of spending rules, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Second reading, please. Okay. Seconded by? Second. Councilor Klein. Any discussion on second reading for this financial order? Um, then I will ask for a <coughs> Yes. 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 It's approved on, on second reading. And we got Councilor Carney's vote on the suspension of rules or? Yes. We got that. And then we got you on second reading. Excellent. Um, now, 19077, in order to establish marijuana community impact fee stabilization. Second. Move approval. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Did I hear you say something? Well, I think. We had Councillor Dwight make the motion and Councillor LeBard was the second. Everyone did everything. Six bad. Okay. Any discussion on this? And motion on the floor as for roll. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LeBard. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Mack. Yes. 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 That is approved on first reading. Next is 19078. In order to dedicate marijuana host community fees to marijuana community impact fee stabilization. Move to approve. Second. Second. And second. Any discussion on this? Roll call. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Mack. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 On first reading, number of financial orders for, in fact, on second reading. <coughs> uh, 
19048, in order to appropriate free cash to cover snow and ice <coughs> deficit. Move for approval. Second. And seconded by Councillor Nash. Any discussion on this order and second? We have a, a seconding war between two <laughs> adjacent it's wards. Ugly. It gets ugly. That can escalate quickly, so let's just. Uh, but we have this on the floor for second reading. Any discussion on second reading? Hearing no discussion, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Yes. 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 That is approved on second reading. Next is 19049, order to authorize the taking, uh, taking of triangular parcel at intersection of Riverside, Elm, and Milton. Second. Ha. <laughs> Made in vociferously, <laughs> passionately <laughs> seconded. <laughs> Probably the finest second I have ever <laughs> witnessed in these chambers. And so we are on the floor where we have discussions. No discussion. Okay. Uh, hearing no discussion, I'll ask for a, a roll call vote on this, please. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Approved on second reading. Next is 19061, in order to appropriate compensation for uh, and authorize eminent domain taking of Land of Damon. Yeah. Oh. Second. Okay, made and second. <laughs> Any discussion about the <laughs> okay. Land of Damon. All right, so no discussion. So we'll Yes. 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 She was fast. She said yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay, that's approved on second reading. Uh, finally, for second reading is 19064. In order to appropriate money and authorize takings by eminent domain for Damon Road reconstruction. Move to approve. approve. Got that, got that made and seconded. <laughs> this actually is for Damon Road. It's not the land of Damon. Any other discussion? Uh, Councilor Nash. I'd like to thank the mayor for these fine maps that he sent us all. Yes. Because they really detail all, you know, <coughs> the questions we were asking last week. And I send that thanks to DPW who actually put in all those questions. So I'll thank DPW as well. Yes. You're here. Thank you. Very good. Any other discussion? Roll call. Yes. 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 Um, we have a number of ordinances which have not yet been referred. <coughs> Six, seven. Seven of them. So. I'd like to move them as a group. Yes. yes. Uh, to legislative matter. <coughs> Uh, joint hearing of the legislative matters in the planning board. Yeah. Do they need to be referred to the planning board as well? Or uh, as well? Yeah, it is a joint hearing yeah. Okay. Uh, to discuss it, so yeah. So to both legislative matters and the planning board? Okay. And I'll read them into the record and for the benefit of the public so they know where to uh, expect. Councilor Dwight made this motion for 19068, <coughs> to amend zoning to add definitions of short-term rental and owner-occupied dwelling. 19069, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in WSP, SC, SR, and RR districts. 19070, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in URA and URB districts. 19071, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in the URC district. 19.072, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in GB, and NB districts. 19.073, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in the CB, EB, HB, and OI districts. 19.074, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow bed and breakfast and short-term rentals in the PV district. So Council Dwight moved those as a group, and it was seconded? I don't know if it. I'll second it. Thank you, Councilor. So Bidwa has seconded that to move as a group to both legislative matters and the planning board. Any discussion on the referral, Council Planning? I'm just wondering if uh, these need to go to community resources as well. 
question is, shall we punish community resources <laughs> with seven <laughs> ordinances? And I'll defer to the chair. Thank you for asking. Um, I, since there's a joint hearing already scheduled between planning and legislative matters, I was gonna not interfere with that and let it just go directly there. We, it can't be on our agenda for Monday. So um, if it's okay with the rest of the committee, I was gonna let that happen. I'm pretty I'm fine. Seeing none. Mm -hmm. Let's do. So the motion stands as just a referral to legislative matters and the planning board. Any further discussion on the question of the referral? of these uh, seven. Um, all those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Opposed, uh, any abstentions? So it is <coughs> both, all those are referred. Um, now, 18 point, these are or ordinances, 18.223, an ordinance relative to parking on Pleasant Street. This is second reading. Motion to approve this, made by Councillor Klein, and second by Councillor Bidwell. Any discussion on this in second reading? You heard about it last meeting. So we're ready for a roll call. Yes. 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 Let's approve in second reading. So I got that right, right? And usually we have second readings after the first readings, but but that was a second reading. Right. Yeah, it was. It, was. Yes, a second. It. it really was. You nailed <laughs> it. <It's confusing>. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we have paperwork for people to sign later. Um Good. Now, first reading, um, and I see our, our senior land use planner is here. Um, it says 18231, an ordinance relative to large scale ground mounted solar arrays. Move, move approval. Second. Okay. Uh, Second. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. That was very collegial of you. <laughs> um, so it's made and seconded. It's on the floor. I'm going to get on the screen when we, we have a chance. Um, um, Please. Do you, would you mind? I, I, I can just lay this out. Okay. This maybe look very familiar to a lot of folks. It actually, uh, um, in legislative matters, uh, part part of the problem was when this was originally introduced, was modified multiple times. Carolyn, will, Carolyn has worked very hard on this with mm -hmm. a lot of uh, associated groups, and not the least of which was the city solicitor, who modified some things by suggesting that, that they weren't legal, at least in his eyes. Um, the public trade, uh, the pub I keep getting this public trade commission. No, the public shade tree committee um, was originally co-sponsors, but had withdrawn their sponsorship after a planning board meeting because the planning board had endorsed a different version. Um, by the time it came to legislative matters for the first time, we had to continue the hearing because the uh, members, well, there was a lot that w had not been cleared up and had not been negotiated and finalized at that point. It, uh, in, in the interim, it was also discussed in energy and sustainability. And the big, it, 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 just to frame this, uh, for those of you who haven't followed this, of course, this is about the removal of trees in order to establish large scale solar arrays um, and part of the driving force of uh, Carolyn's initiative actually was that currently there there's a backdoor loophole that would allow developers to basically clear-cut areas without any restrictions because we had no rules in place for something like this and there's and the, it, there was with two proposals already in play and then I think more to come was critical that we at least have guidelines and rules and trigger points to establish those I mean, that, that would in, invoke those rules. Um, the, the consensus and the concern is also that because you're actually talking about two systems that have one similar benefit, one the um, solar energy is green and clean energy and it's renewable and that's enormously appealing principally because it reduces the consumption of uh, high carbon fossil fuel systems. But at the same time, trees are a very natural system by which we do carbon sequestration. And you had two goods competing um, and creating a, a, essentially a dilemma, a dilemma that, that the state has not been particularly helpful on. There is no um, rules re relative to this. Most communities have actually been left fairly vulnerable because as 
the more ideal property to develop solar large scale solar arrays tends to be open space farmland of course comes into play but with uh, conservation restrictions I mean agricultural restrictions makes it very makes it more expensive or difficult for them so they start focusing on landlocked uh, forested areas so I got an enormous education in the process of this conversation but also I, I, I think what's which is more than worth noting is the um, cooperation and deep discussion and analysis uh, done by all respective groups including citizen groups who've been involved in this and and the energy and sustainability committee and the tree committee of course being one of the driving forces and most especially Karen um, so the language that you now see reflects the end result of all those negotiations has been signed off on I think by everyone who's touched this so far in agreement it is uh, a usable compromise and more <coughs> importantly it's one of the few <coughs> actual, uh, zoning protections for something like this for this new developing field essentially and um, uh, Willie Lombard the chair of the public shade tree committee and the public trade commission um, has uh, been in consult with a number of communities particularly in the hill towns and considering using our regulations if this should pass as a template f uh, for their community to protect that so that said that it comes with uh, e the endorsement and, and positive recommendation I think from every committee <laughs> good to hear it used to be we didn't believe that we could ever combine chocolate and peanut butter together. No. <laughs> <laughs> Proven that's not true. <coughs> so you've done with trees and I solar panels. It's the nature of how you deal with competing interests, and I think we've done the best that we could given the circumstances. Yeah. Thank you. And would the planning department or the mayor or anyone like to add anything or summarize? Or? I'll take it on right now. <laughs> 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 <coughs> so that the Trade Commission is still on here, though. Trade Commission is yet to hear from them, but they're federal. So I wouldn't wait for them. I was, I was being too facetious. I, yeah, the, no. the Public so Trade Tree Commission you. is still a sponsor. That's okay. Well, it's not okay. Yeah. yeah did, but they came back. They, oh, good. They come back. So it has. They they are co-sponsors. I don't Welcome. because as I remember, what came before legislative matters did include their their. Sponsorship, so so that's cool. Okay. Everyone's all kumbaya. Nice, Councillor Klein. I just have a question about the version that we have here because I see that um, it's clearly an amended version, but there was a iteration in between. I think this one and the original that is not reflected here. Does that sound right? Because I see that where it says you know two acres and then it used to say five acres and is not so reflected here. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the one you have now is sort of the final, final. So it has some of these newer features that are not reflected. Okay. Okay, but we're not seeing all of those amendments essentially is, is what. Right. Okay. We're seeing, um, I think it would, I think it would have been hard to follow all the strikes. So just, just I guess to follow up on what Councillor Dwight is saying, um, it went through so many iterations that we can't, we can't actually see all of those iterations and it can come out on the other side and this is something that we're going to get briefings on. And one of the most significant pieces that was discussed was um, originally it called for only when you hit that threshold of only the removal of five acres of uh, forest um, and now we're down to two and that was something that the public shade tree committee um, fought hard for and I see that it ended up here so um, just to kind of uh, give my personal feeling that this was vetted really carefully and um, the sign off was a strong sign off because it did go through so many iterations thank you um, and on that point, it is, it is something that I, I always want, um, particularly from the planning department, which I think is challenging for some of the ordinances you work on because they're long and involved and have you know, measurements and a lot of technical language. Like, 
I really would like to have ordinances come from the planning department that show the existing code and then like a track changes so we can see not every change along the way, but the final change. I think that's important in order for us to really understand and catch the details. So that'd be my request for all future ordinances. And in fact, if it's not too much trouble, can you, can you take the final, the final set of changes that you wish to see and do attract changes against the current ordinance so we can see where the, where the changes are? That's really how ordinances should be formatted. That's what this is, though. For the second reading. Yeah. Is that what this is? I'm not clear. It's not in that there are the track changes yeah. sections, but it's not the entire. Right. Well, you can certainly. It's not the entire um, yeah. ordinance for each table because we have different um, tables where different uses are allowed. So this, these do provide the track changes. Okay. Sections that um, are they do okay. amended, but um, uh, you don't have the whole table for each of those zoning districts. Well, that's okay to not have the whole table. I just want to make sure that what we're looking at, like for example, when we see this, you know, a, a page of new text that this is this is new text. Right. It's not just an amendment to. That's right. New, okay. So it's else. added to the, there's some deletions from the special permit criteria, and then it, that yeah. whole page of new text would be added to the special permit criteria. Yep. Yeah. Okay. As long as that's the case, and that's kind of the way we do it. So I thank you. I appreciate okay. it. It makes sure. it easier for me to understand. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, please. Yeah. Oh, and I, I would just like to thank Carolyn for uh, there was a number of stakeholders on this and one group would move the cheese and then the other would want to get a crack at it again. And I mean, it went back and forth between various stakeholders a number of times. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to get it, to get everybody that had an interest to buy into this version before it came here. Because you know, we find ourselves in a position to have to make a political decision that, that doesn't always respect everybody that put a lot of work into it. So it was a really good thing that it all got worked out between the various stakeholders in this and came to us with consensus <coughs> so that we weren't in a position where we had to pick one over the other or one interest over the other. You know, the people put in a lot of time and a lot of volunteer time and a lot of effort and all of them needed to be respected in the process and I'm really glad you guys worked that all out and it came here with consensus so we can vote to move it along and be confident that everybody that worked hard on it gets satisfied. So that's a big thing. Council of the Barge. Yes, um, Carolyn, with this ordinance and the problem that we had in Ward 6, first plans that came out was probably like about maybe 24, 25 trees on the first plan that we saw. That was just the draft that they brought in. Now that we have this ordinance, the previous owners went in and cut 247 trees because the solar company did not own that property yet. It was indeed it to them. This, this is what initiated this problem. When I talked with Lily Lombard, we were all furious that 247 trees were removed at the gravel pit, Willard's um, gravel pit. And my question now is, has the solar company brought in any plans into your office of helping out the residents on Lady Slipper Lane? They were supposed to be working with them. They did bring plans. Making plan the buffer for them. Have you seen that? Yes, and the plans went back to the planning board at their last <coughs> meeting, and I think everything has been addressed from. So is this ordinance going to protect us now? So that when we have a solar company, say Jim owned the land, can he still, even though a solar company is in the process of buying it, can he still go in there and cut all those trees? So it would, so there's a, um, a what we call a look back provision. So, um, and it's based on property. So if trees are cut on a property for a particular project, mm -hmm. but then um, 
the land transfers ownership to someone else and then that next person applies for a permit, there's a 12 month look back to um, see what, how, what the site was before and then that would trigger the special permit criteria. So um, that's how we're, that's one of the ways in which we're trying to um, close. Close that, that. okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, anything else on this ordinance? Sounds like we might be ready to vote on it. So thank you. And I'll ask for a roll call. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Bobby. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Yes. Councilor Sarah. Yes. Councilor Sarah. Yes. Okay. So we've done first reading. Um, next is 19039, ordinance relative to parking on Main Street Lawrence. Motion to approve this. Just get on the floor or do you want me to read it first? Okay, Councilor Klein makes the motion. Second. Second, Second by Councilor Nash, if you should say. And um, so, all right, so what this is is um, Ordinance of City Council, uh, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be ordained by the City Council, et cetera, as follows. This is um, um, uh, modifying Section 312.104 of the Code of Ordinances so that it be amended as follows. Within um, that section, 312.104, it's Schedule 3, Limited Time Parking. Uh, we make changes to two rows. First, the row that currently reads Main Street in Florence, and there is a kind of language there that just shows historical information about when it's been amended, it's not really part of the ordinance. Main Street in Florence on the northerly side, I believe. Uh, two hours, all, so I think this is the, the duration of parking, the limited time parking allowed, that's my understanding, uh, from 140 feet east of the easterly side of Kai's Street uh, to the easterly to a point change 30 to 72 feet west of Chestnut Street. Okay, so 30 to 72. And then we're going to add the following row Main Street in Florence, on the northerly side, 15 minutes, um, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Saturday from a point 30 feet west of Chestnut Street to a point 72 feet west of Chestnut Street. Councilor Murphy. Uh, Councilor Nash actually figured all this out and could explain it to us because it's... I couldn't the other day. It's kind of, it's kind of like... <laughs> but Councilor Nash has got the hint. <coughs> yeah, uh, okay. Uh, the, the, you have the diagram up there. This is to create two 15-minute parking spaces on Main Street and Florence um, at the corner of Chestnut Street in front of Cooper's Corners. Uh, this was a uh, request by Cooper's Corners and also with full support of the pie bar across the street. And this is part of a, uh, in, you know, an initiative that we're taking with the TPC to tweak things in this area uh, as there's been a lot of reports of parking congestion and hardship over the years, mm -hmm. so. And, and also, the Florence got changed to two hour parking from one hour parking. Right. So for people running in and running out, they're competing with people that can stay there for two hours. So <coughs> adding the 15 minute spaces is important to the merchants because people can now stay there for two hours. So this frees up spaces for high bar or coopers for people to come and go quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? What's that? Yeah. Councilor Dwight. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, recuse myself from this vote just because of any any sense of undue influence and, and profound impact on my ability to uh, do business as, as employee of the Florence Pie Bar. So I, I will recuse myself from the vote. Okay. So noted. Thank you. Um, Councilor Klein. I'd just like to say that this photo is so impressive in the uh, solar array on Cooper's Corner. <laughs> Take a look at that. That's I so know. impressive. I know. That's not it's true. There, I didn't realize it. It's no good trees. to see. No, no trees, trees were destroyed. No what? No trees were involved. I'm always fine with 15 minute parking spaces as long as it kind of serves a, a general community. I mean, it does probably benefit the business, like the Pie Bar and Cooper's, clearly. But I mean, it's downtown Florence, so I think it's useful for a lot of different people. So that's why I'd be happy to support it personally. Okay. 
Any other discussion? So it's on the floor, isn't it? Yes. Then we can have a roll call. Abstain. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Okay, that ordinance approved in first reading. Now we have 19.052, um, an ordinance relative to parking on Chestnut Street. Um, again. Approval. Okay, seconded by? Second. Councilor Labarge. Um, do you want to waive reading on this and also defer to the chair of the TPC to explain? Sounds like perhaps mm -hmm. yeah. that's the tacit will of the council. <laughs> so, uh, good reading of the tacit. Mr. Chairman, you're okay. You're up. So, on Chestnut Street, there's this teeny tiny no parking zone that no car can fit in, and um, that it's again, it's you know, in in relationship to Cooper's and the Pie Bar. Um, it's it's about five feet long, and people try to park there, and um, in, inevitably their car is too big for the spot, and they park too close to the person's driveway, and um, and that people end up being ticketed there. And um, there's another important component here that's going on is you can see with with Coopers, their loading dock is there, and they have they'll have large trucks back up, and they need to have that this space clear so that the trucks can uh, back into their loading dock. Um, so the proposal was to take away this space, which has been contentious, and um, and just uh, start the parking zone further up the street where uh, there's actual space for a vehicle. Okay. <laughs> but only on one side, actually. Only not, on one side. Not on the side that Cooper's is on. That stays the same. Correct. Western, western there is side. actually parking is allowed on both sides of yeah. Chestnut. There, uh, Councillor Murphy and I have also put in a uh, a word to DPW to consider um, having it be no parking on the the westerly side. Nobody parks there currently because pretty much everybody assumes it's no parking, and um, so I we'll see if that's forthcoming. But. So you're, this ordinance would say, um, on the westerly side, we're changing uh, the word both to westerly, so on Chestnut Street from Main Street in Florence to a point uh, northerly for the northerly 460 feet. That is no, that is parking prohibited. Okay, um, and then on the easterly side, we had a new line: Chestnut Street easterly, Main Street Florence to a point 195 feet northerly from Main Street. Okay. So on that side, it's parking prohibited in a little, little bit longer. Yeah. Right. That's okay. Take Got that it. Space okay. That isn't big enough. Okay. So I've just inadvertently read the ordinance. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> we good. Any Probably dis good idea. discussion? <laughs> uh, Councilor Sharon. Not to quibble. I just want to. It's we keep calling it a space. It's really not a space. It's just a certain number of feet. And what might be hard to see, but I know you mentioned it on this, is that there's a driveway there. So the reason that it's more than five feet when you add it to, to get to 195 feet. It's the because there's a driveway, and then it's the other side of the driveway. So we're just extending that no parking a certain number of feet past that driveway. It's really not. It's not, a, it's not like a space that we're getting rid of. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's uh -uh. just a certain number of feet we are including in the no parking. There's no real spaces there, right? It's just parking between driveways and on the A smart elements. car could fit in the space that currently uh, exists. Uh -huh. Standing but on end. On <laughs> right. If you allow for the three feet that they're required to park away from the driveway, it's about two and a half feet left. Right. right. Okay. And a, and a sign that's completely obscured by a tree. Uh, by the way, I, I I feel comfortable in voting for this because insofar as we're actually limiting parking, and there is no direct benefit to. Uh, uh, Pi bar that I don't. That right, I'm going to take a risk on this. Totally up to you. Well, I invite anyone to report me, but I'm going to really take a chance on this one and vote on this one. Anyway, you've disclosed a relationship. Right. So. I've already opined, so I've already, that crossed through that threshold already. So. Is there any more discussion on this ordinance relative to Chestnut Street parking on Chestnut Street? Hearing, hearing no other discussion, I'll ask for a roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. 
Yes. 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 Okay, that is approved on first reading. And finally, 19.062, an ordinance to amend Chapter 5 of the Code of Ordinances by amending Section 57, Special Municipal Employees. This is the first reading. Uh, Move approval. Okay. Second. Okay, made and seconded, so it's on the floor. Um, so I, I will, this is exactly like the one that was done for the Charter Review Committee. Um, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just read it for fun, okay? Um, let's see, just so we very clear here. So, be ordained by the City Council. Wait, am I, do I have the right one here? Because yeah, we have one for the Charter Review, review Committee. This is one for the Pest Aside Committee. Got it. All right. That's right, okay. So this is 19.062 in ordinance to amend Chapter 5 of the Code of Ordinances by amending Section 57 Special Municipal Employees. An ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts provided that the Code of Ordinances, providing that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, to be amended by adding um, Chapter 57 of said Code. It says Section Chapter 57 of said Code. Just means Chapter 57, I guess. Providing that uh, 57 Part 1 Administrative Legislation, Administration of Government, Special Municipal Employees be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and the City Council assembles as follows. Chapter 5 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts shall be amended by um, adding um, chapter or section 5-7, which shall read as follows. So uh, section 5-7, Special Municipal Employees. In accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, chapter 268A, section 1N, the following positions of the City of Northampton shall be and hereby are designated as special municipal employees. This ordinance shall supersede all prior orders of the Northampton City Council designating special municipal employees and any order designating a position as special municipal employee that is not set forth herein shall be and is hereby rescinded. So we're adding, um, I take it under uh, or as one of members of the following boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, City Council Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction. All right. And so we already have this on the floor. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Uh, came out of legislative matters with a positive recommendation. Okay. Cool. Uh, so hearing no other discussion, we'll have a roll call, please. Councilor Navarro? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Mayer? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Okay, approved on first reading. Any other new business this evening? Um, to adjourn. Adjourn. Okay. Motion to adjourn is made and seconded. All those in favor, adjourn. Please say aye. 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 Good night.